Welcome back to the Name Redacted Podcast, America's most beloved podcast, the most downloaded Red Sox podcast in the world. Coming off a big time series win. Huge, huge win against the Kansas City Royals. Uh, But this episode is sponsored by Knock Around Sunglasses, quality polarized affordable shades, including new MLB and U.S. uh, women's soccer team pairs. Check them out at knockaround.com. It is September. Um, I think we we kind of, as I said, uh, before the season started uh, a couple of weeks ago, we circled back on it. We looked at that stretch of games against the Yankees, the Astros, the Dodgers, and then the Astros again. Like that was the gauntlet where you were going to find out what your team is made of. If this is a potential playoff team, when you come out on the other side of that, uh, I think last week when we talked about the the reality of the situation was that after the sweep the uh, at the hands of the Houston Astros that the season was basically over and uh came on here and i acted as such i said a lot of negative things and the listeners of this podcast oh boy were they unhappy with me uh, in the They're last beating few your days. ass in the streets yeah they they dragged my ass uh they were like Man, Jared is so negative and blah, 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 blah. I even had people say uh, that I didn't, uh, I need to be better to the fans. Someone said that. Someone said he needs to be better to the fans, uh, which is crazy. Uh, the, the people that were coming at me for being negative. And you know what? For that, I, I'm, I would just like to apologize. Thank you. To absolutely nobody. Oh. The double champ does what the f- he wants. I am not sorry at all. I'm not sorry at all for being negative. Because if you want, if you want your fucking Red Sox podcast to not be uh, emotional about their team, go listen to like the Boston Glow, like all those people that cover the team in the press box, they don't actually care about the team. You would be surprised to find out how many, well, I mean, Chris Cotillo grew up a Red Sox fan, but he'll tell you he's not a Red Sox fan anymore. Uh, How many writers grew up Mets fans or whatever? Like they're they're not Red Sox. If you want coverage that takes the the emotion out of it, the passion, the actual give a shit attitude, fine. There's plenty of alternatives out there. But if you want a podcast or people that are going to cover this team that actually care about the Boston Red Sox, well, here you are. And what comes with that is emotion is a uh, passion for the team, which is I'm pretty sure the central message of the last episode where people said I was being too negative. Uh, maybe it's, maybe it's the fact that now like I'm in my thirties, like you kind of just on, on a, on a deep level here, you kind of just like have that sense of mortality where when you're in your early 20s, you're in high school, you're a teenager, you're like, I love the Red Sox. Like, I'm going to watch the Red Sox forever. Like, now that I'm in, like, my mid-30s, I'm like, I only got so many fucking seasons left. Right. Like, let's go. Right. No, you're no, not no, 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 You're not going to die. Saying, well, you're going to die. Jake's going to die. I'm going to die. Everyone listening to this is going to die. I could live forever. No, you can't. You're probably going to die really soon, by the way. Don't say that. I'm just Stop saying. It. I'm just not going to die soon. I'm just saying. Like I you, saw how many cigarettes you smoked in that video. Okay, you I'm that's dying before I'm, you do. Exactly. So I'm just looking at it like, all right, you you only have so many seasons left. It's another season. Put it. I only care about baseball. Like I don't care about other sports. I don't have fun things that I like to do in the off season. It's almost like I'm my birthday. It is literally on opening day, and then the season ends, and I wait for baseball season again. So it's almost like a year of my life only exists inside the baseball season. Once baseball season's over, it's like that year to me is over. The rest waiting for opening day again is purgatory. Like my year is within the baseball season. So after the Astros sweep the Red Sox, and I think we all safely put the season to bed, like, all right, postseason chances. And we can have the deeper conversation about uh, well, the expectations were it, it was never playoffs or bust. I agree. But shame on me for having this little thing called blind faith, blind hope. Like it was never promised. It was never guaranteed. The playoffs were never guaranteed. But I think what we kind of looked at was 
all right, this team could win 86, 87 games, and maybe that's enough to get in. It was all it was always the maybe where they'll fall win-wise is enough to get in. That was always a thing. Then it kind of became once the season started rolling along, that you know, to get in, the bar was much higher this year. It's not a matter of the Red Sox falling short of where we thought that they would end up. They're probably still going to end up right in the neighborhood of where we thought they were going to end up at the start of spring training. So that's not to say that you're disappointed in the team. I think the disappointment is that it's almost that childlike Christmas morning. Like, yes, it's going to be cool to get presents, but there's this one thing that I really, really want. And I really hope that when I open up that box, that it's going to be that one thing that I was hoping for. Like we got presents this year. Jaron Duran emerging and becoming the player that he that he was this year. That's a really cool gift. Tristan Casas entering play today. Sixth highest OPS in the American League. That's a really cool gift to open. Like going around here, like Adam Duvall has been a pleasant surprise. Uh, Rafael Devers at the end of it all, like he's having a Rafael Devers type season. We can talk about the defense later, but offensively, there's been some moments. There's been some walk offs. There's been there's been mo- there's been things to be happy about uh, in a vacuum for this Red Sox season. But that one big gift that I wanted to open, where I didn't know if I was going to get it or not, but I really that's the one thing I really wanted. That was the playoffs, and I opened up all my gifts this year, and now I'm out of presents to open up. And that one big one, the playoffs, I know I'm not getting it. So it's okay to be. It's okay to be upset about that. I I always had that blind hope that maybe we would get that. It's to to have that moment of sinking in and and coming to terms coming to terms with there is a finite number of days in the Red Sox season now. Because when you're a playoff team, there's there's a lot of excitement in this could end in the first week of October, the second week, this could go all the way to November. We don't know. Like that's exciting when you know that you're going to be a playoff team. But when you come to terms with the fact that it's over, you're not getting in. Well, now we go back to that Verdugo quote when he was like, well, there's only 11 weeks left. Just got to get through these. Like Verdugo was mailing it in six weeks ago, 11 weeks, you know, now that's where I'm at. I wasn't quite there yet. When the Blue Jays swept the Red Sox at Fenway and Tyler ruined the season, like I, I tweeted out the death certificate, but I needed to see that next. I needed to see August. I needed to see where they ended up after that New York, Houston, LA, Houston stretch. At the end of it, they got swept by the Astros, effectively costing them a chance at playing in the postseason. So if you think that I'm being too negative, Because I'm coming to terms with in real time, like I can go back and play you a video from 2017 when the Red Sox got eliminated from the postseason in 2017. Like that's that's the thing about being in content creation is I always have a fucking camera or a microphone in front of my face at all times. That's my job. So you're going to get a raw reaction. And I already told the people listening uh, after... Uh, the, when we recorded the last episode, that was my fifth show of the day in hour number 13 of my work day. And the red, and I'm coming to terms with the Red Sox season being over. So excuse me if I was too fucking negative last episode because I still care because, because this is, uh, this is year 15 Year, a season 15 or 16 of me covering the Boston Red Sox. And it still hurts every time that I have to come to terms with the fact that the season's over. Like it's people will ask me that question all the time. Like, is it just a job for you now? Like, is it just like, is it just a no, no. Like it's still my life. It's still my number one passion. It's still a thing that I care the most about besides like my family. Like this is, this is my life. We said that when we recorded the video, come on over to DraftKings. I was like, hey, what you're getting is a guy that goes balls to the wall, fucking 14 hour days, seven days a week during baseball season. I'm going all in. And this is my life. Like people will say like, oh, yeah, like, you know, so like this thing is my life. And I'm like, no, no, no. 
It's actually my life. So if I have a moment where maybe I'm a little negative, bear with me here. Because the one thing that pissed me, there are a few things that pissed me off. There is one dude that commented that said something like, you know, Jared, it's really offensive uh, when you say that, you know, like like you get paid to play base, to watch baseball and like I have to have a real job. It's insulting to people like me, bro. I didn't win a fucking contest for this job. I've been working at this since I was 16 years old. And I did work real jobs. I worked in retail. I worked a fucking desk job. I was in college for seven years to get a business degree, to work at an SEO firm that I didn't want to do. Like, I don't, I've never lost my perspective of the fact that I am lucky that I get to do what I love. I get to have a job where I get to talk about the Red Sox and baseball, and that's my career. And it's been everything that I ever hoped it would be and more. It like it is far exceeded anything that I ever could have possibly dreamed that it would become. It has. But at the end of the day, don't you ever think that I've lost perspective because I know how lucky I am. But don't try and say this guy doesn't get it like this guy doesn't. I've worked real jobs. I know that I'm lucky that I have this job, but I didn't win a fucking contest to get this job. I worked my ass off to get this job and all everything in between. So I'm a, I think I'm allowed to have a bad day. I think it was like I even said like, hey, uh, long day for me. Show number five. Uh, got some uh, some some family members that aren't doing super great right now. I've got some health problems of my own. I know that I talked about on baseball is dead. I'm not even talking about the ear thing. I've got some health problems of my own that I've been putting off because we've done 600 plus episodes of section 10, fucking 500 episodes of starting nine. I've been on all of them, every single one in their existence. Since I started this career seven, eight years ago, I've taken one vacation and I brought my microphone with me. It was last November, still did shows while I was on it. So to anyone that's like, oh, he's lost perspective or, oh, like be better for the. No, I'm allowed to have a bad day. And I think it was pretty explainable why I would have been in a bad mood, because at the end of the day, what I've been saying all along when when we started Section 10, I was like, I want to create a product content that I would consume if I were me. Like if it were available to me, what would I want it to look like? Starting with people that actually care about the subject matter. I was sitting there being like, why would I read a columnist writing about the Red Sox when I know that he's like a Mets fan or I know that he openly doesn't care about the Red Sox? I will never apologize for caring about the Red Sox. I will never apologize for uh, especially maybe a little bit of an overreaction being a little bit dramatic. I can be dramatic sometimes. I will, you know, if people want accountability, hand up. Maybe I'm a little dramatic sometimes, I, but I, it's only I because that, I give a fuck. That's it. I think that's where people are looking for it. It's like anything, right? Like you spend time with your family, with your friends every day, no matter what you do things, you're going to have a day where you're not acting like yourself, where you're quiet. And I think that more than anything, the negativity, well, you know, hand up, you know, I think me and Coley saw it a little differently, how we viewed the team. So we weren't as hurt or broke up over a lot of people coming to the realization of what the ceiling of this team was. I think the only thing where it wasn't you was when you went quiet, right? Like that's not Jared. Jared is usually the one kind of driving the bus in the conversation. And I think, like you said, you were just, it wasn't your day. You're not feeling great. Your head's kind of out of it. You're dealing with shit off the pod, on the pod, a million different ways. That was the thing that I kind of looked at from last episode. And I was like, that's just not Jared, right? Like Jared is usually more lively. He's trying to get a word in or waiting to get a word in. I get that. I think all the other stuff, it's like, yeah, you're upset. You're down. Some people are going to get mad and say, well, you've lost perspective of who you are, whatever it may be. When you're in this job and you do it every day as well, you know, there's a lot of things other people don't get when the Red Sox are playing bad and you get to unplug and you don't have to think or you can take a week off. That's a lot for some people. No matter what we do here, we have to watch every single game. We have to, you know, these games in Kansas City, when even the Red Sox accounts that are into the Red Sox all year, tweeting news, whatever, look at their interactions over the last week. They've all kind of teetered down over the last couple of days. So 
you know, while you get to enjoy the best parts. And, you know, there's some people, no matter what, they're 162 guys and girls, no matter what's going on, you ride those ups and downs when it's your day job and you don't have that escape from that. I think that's something that not everyone can relate to that doesn't work in this industry. So, yeah, I, dude, you've been on constantly for people one time in all these years to get upset and say, what the fuck's going on? It happens. It happens. All you can do is kind of put your hand up and say, all right, I'm sorry. That wasn't me today. And it's kind of what you're doing, right? I do think you, would you say you were probably the most quiet you've ever been in a podcast last episode? Well, I think the other thing too, is that it was on purpose for the most part. Like we don't get Coley all that often, especially if we do get Coley, it's a phone call and we got Coley for the whole episode. And I know we haven't had him lately at all. We haven't had him lately either. And I think, like it, I wasn't like sitting back pouting. I was like, I know that people like to see like people have gotten years of me and Coley riffing together. They've they're they've yet to experience like a lot of you and Coley. And like, I think you talk to me all the time. You don't get to talk to Coley a lot. I was as a listener. I'm like, this is good shit. Like, I'm going to hang back. I don't need to hear my own voice. If I know that this is good and what you guys are doing is good. I'm going to hang back and and let it go. And like people, were, I don't know what it was like. There's always just like something in the fucking universe where. Uh, like. They'll love you for like the longest time and then they'll just all like in one inch swoop. It's like, all right, fuck Jared. Like, let's. And then there's just like a million fucking hate threads. And I'm like, bro, <laughs> I don't I don't. It is what it is. Like, I, I, there, there's just like some weeks you can't do anything right. But I don't I'm never going to let stuff like that affect how I do my job. Like to, to go back to the main point, there's no amount of hate that I can receive that's going to make me care less about my job. Like my job has always been number one. And I'll say this again and I'll double down on it. I have I have lost relationships because of this job. Like. I'm 34 and not ma- not even close to like it's because of this job. Like I chose this career over people. I missed my fucking cousin that I consider a brother. I missed his wedding last October because of this job. So I don't ever want to hear like, oh, you need to be better to the fans. I do shit for the fans all the time. It's stuff that you'll never even hear about. You hear about some of it. Stuff, most of it, you'll never even hear about. Like I, every single episode, I am here. I have been here since we started from day one. Haven't missed a show. Sick, traveling, fucking long hours, whatever. I'm here. Been here. Gonna be here. So, yeah. Like I, I that was, like I said, like I don't, like hate stuff is never gonna make me uh, deviate from how I do it. But I will clap back if I think that you've stepped over a line of sorts, because I mean, I was 16 years old logging into fucking MySpace and responding to messages from people, uh, you know, every day, all day, every day. But I have existed half of my time on this earth trying to do everything I could to build a community and give back to Red Sox fans and baseball fans. That's all I know. That is all I know. So anyways, uh, yeah, it was, I think it's, I think it's pretty understandable why I would be uh, a little negative. Um, but I, I, I don't really, I don't regret it. Like I, I don't, I don't. Did reg- you, when we finished recording last episode, did you think that was going to be the reaction? No, no, because we finished with like, like 40 fucking minutes of like talking about like funny songs and like reminiscing on middle school. Like at no point did I thought I, I cut some scathing promo on the Boston Red Sox and I was like, fuck this team and fuck everybody. See ya. And then cut the mic. Like, yeah, I was I was upset that this that basically the season's over and there's a I lot think- of uncertainty ahead. And we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk uh- about that as well. There is uncertainty ahead. So like, yeah, like I think it's it's frustration about like, oh man, like you, you you're waiting to you're, you're thirsty and you think that there's a well ahead and then you finally get to the well and there's no water in it. And you're like, 
fuck. All right. Continue walking down the road till we get to a well. Like that's that's kind of like the frustration of it is I'm trying to drink some goddamn water and I'm thirsty as hell, Tyler. And I think where people were kind of like, I, I'm surprised or I don't get it. It was like, you know, all year we've talked about the expectation was, well, you're going to get a hamburger. You're going to get a hamburger. You're going to get a hamburger. Well, you got the fucking hamburger and you're sitting here saying, what the fuck this? You know, I can't see the future. I don't know where this thing's going. I'm concerned. I'm having a hard time believing in the stuff that's going on with this team in front of me. And I think that's just where the disconnect for a lot of people was. And even to me a little bit, I was like, all right, like it, it's hard, right? Because if you're not upset about them kind of falling out of the race and falling out of that conversation, it's like, well, are you really a fan? Even if you have your takes, your predictions, right? Like I always put my hand up and I say, fuck my takes. I'd rather be wrong if it means the Red Sox are going to play good. Like at the end of the day, I just want to see the team succeed. That's what's best for the podcast. That's what's best for the fans. That's what's best for everyone here. I guess it just seemed like kind of how you framed it. You were hoping for more, hoping for more. I think it just seemed like your expectations raised a little bit above what was always the most likely scenario or what in reality, this team had shown us the first four and a half months, you know, a week before September, before the Astro series. Yeah. And that, but that's you as a fan. At the same reason, that's why people love you because at the end of the day, uh, apparently you're not. rooting harder than anybody. Apparently not. It, it's a hard, <laughs> but it's a hard balance. When things are going well, like people will give you that love and be like, oh, like no one's more excited than Jared. But when you take well, it harder to than be other fair people, to those people, people were saying like, you know, we love Jared, but like not his best episode. If if you do love Jared, then you would know. Like, hey, guess what? Because it is some sort of in there, like a psychology experiment because you can ask the question if you thought that they were going to win 86, 87 games, which they're still basically on pace to do, right? Like, wh- yep. like what do they have to do to finish with 86 wins? What's the record that uh, they have to finish with? Uh, what they're at 71 wins right now. There's 25 games left. They'd have to go 14 and 11 to get to 85. Very so reasonable. Wins. Very reasonable. Just right? stay on pace. Stay on pace for what you're Very reasonable. They could still win right in the wheelhouse of what we expected them to be. I think people were just misinterpreting like where my frustrations were at. Like it wasn't like, man, what the fuck? Like they didn't make the playoffs. Like, man, it's like, well, no, like you just kind of always you hold out hope that the universe will just like make the Mariners slow down. And maybe there's a Red Sox winning streak out of nowhere. And the next thing you know, like you, you get in on the last day of the season. Like it was more just like the, the hopelessness of, I didn't want to get to September and not have meaningful games to talk about. And that was the disappointment of it all is, uh, like, yeah, like that That to me was the disappointment was flirt with me a little bit. It's almost like you just you ask a girl on a date and she was just like <laughs> spit in your face. <laughs> like, at least be like, I'll think about it. Like, we didn't even get that. We got to see, the first of September and it was just straight up. Nope. No. Hard no. I, I and I would frame it. I think the way you say like she spit in your face, that would have been like if it even resembled more of last year or even worse. I think in this situation, like, well, at least, you know, you guys kind of went through the talking phase. Like it, it seemed legit for a stretch, like, oh, fuck, maybe I might be able to pull this one off. But ultimately, you realize pretty quickly, yeah, I am out of their league. Like this chick, she's entertaining my text messages right now, but she's just doing it because she has nothing better to do. Mm-hmm. Like we're not going on a date. And that's what it was. I think we all looked at September was like, you know what? We're going to have a chance. We're going to go out there. You can kind of play for it and see what happens. Well, you didn't make it past the texting stage. And. That's where you are. You were so close. You you know what? You were texting about the details back and forth. She just for one reason never responded and then just acted like the conversation kept going. Yeah. So like I think people, that's what it is. You're, people you're were more upset. Back. People were more upset with the emotional attachment discussion, which like, I, I thought was fair in certain ways. I, I do. I think uh, I just, I think I explained myself perfectly fine. Like you're you are more likely to have an emotional attachment to someone uh or a player that has participated in a winning season and that's where the devers the sale love comes from it's like they were on championship teams with Casas, even some of the guys from 2021 who were only here for a short stretch right? yeah and, and then with casas it was like we we interviewed him the second because people were like well, how, do, how does he have an emotional attachment to tristan casas but not brian bayo it's like he got drafted uh 
like he he came on the podcast before he even signed with the Red Sox. Like he got drafted, came on the podcast, and then signed with the Red Sox. Like so, we've kind of seen it from day one. Like that's where I'm talking about. Like the emotional attachment thing. It's a personal thing. Like if people are, like, what do you mean? It's like, how That's are you going to tell is. me how I feel about that, dude? And and I and Duran was an omission because people were like, how did he say Duran? I was like, I, I'm not. I wasn't thinking about Duran. You're like, yes, like there's an emotional attachment to Duran, but yeah, that got blown way the fuck out of proportion. I, I, I'm just I sitting think- there. I'm sitting there on my couch, like fucking scrolling the Reddit, which like. That that's kind of like what pissed me off was like, I like being in there and, and engaging because because it's such a lose lose, right? Like people will like as the audience continues to grow, people will say, oh, well, he doesn't interact anymore. Oh, he's too big for us. He doesn't interact anymore. And I do on, on the Section 10 Reddit. I'm in there all the time interacting with people. But if I go in there and it's nothing but bullshit where people are just like saying all this fucking awful shit that I'm like. All right, then fuck you too. Like I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna come in here. You know what I mean? Like, it, so it is what it you is. feel. Yeah, you feel the difference definitely on the weeks. Like some weeks, I'm checking the Section Ten subreddit every day, a couple times a day, where I'm like, oh, I just want to see what people are reacting. Then you have a week like this week where it's like, you know, it's not the easiest to kind of go through it. And some some shots are fair, some shots you kind of look at a little bit sideways. And I think the conversation about being attached to guys. Like you did say, it's subjective. I think a lot of people, especially a lot of people who listen to this podcast, they're into the prospects. They're into the guys who come up. So you hold on to guys a little bit differently. Yeah. I was even thinking about this after we talked and I said the Bayo stuff. I was like, well, I was sitting there tweeting fucking Brian Bayo highlights yeah. every day and making it part of my narratives and my points talking about watch when this guy fucking shows up. Yeah, like so Blaze Jordan. Be- Blaze Jordan's yeah, not exactly. here yet, but like. He's he's the homie. Like we, if Blaze Jordan were up here right now, I'd be like, yeah, fuck yeah. He hasn't won a championship or hasn't been like a, on a a winning team with the Boston Red Sox. Hasn't played in the big leagues yet. But like, if he got traded this off season, it's like, oh man, like that that sucks. You know, like I don't know. And I, I don't want to spend too much time on it because like it, it is stupid at the end of the day. Uh, but yeah, like there are just some bullshit comments that I had to call out. Like like people acting like I didn't have perspective um, about the job when I do. And like, I, I know how lucky I am to have this job and be able to to uh, do what I do and like make mu- a living uh, based on something that I love. But I think on the flip side, like I'm, I'm going to put the ball back in your court. You don't understand how much fucking work it is and how draining it is. And for me, like a person with like social anxiety uh, and has had bouts of depression that you have to be on every day. I can't take a day off. You know what I mean? Like it's like Monday. Is a show. Tuesday's a show. Wednesday's a show. Thursday's a show. Friday, uh, I'm at Fenway because I got to do interviews. And then Sunday night, we're doing the podcast again. Saturday, it's like, all right, well, Saturday, maybe I got to, like, I, I haven't had time to see my friends and my family. So got to squeeze that in somewhere. You got to, you know, be in a good mood for, for them because they don't get to see you. So that's the hard part, especially for me. Like, I'm sure it's easier for some people. For me, it's not as easy because I don't have time to be human during the baseball season from from March until November, I don't have time to be human. Like the fact that I like went to the doctor was crazy. Like, like I have, <laughs> I don't even have a primary care doctor because I don't like, I haven't had time. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I, if I, if something's really I wrong, I gotta go to, yeah, I gotta go to fucking urgent care to, if I, if something like goes wrong. And it, so that's, that's the part that like, I'll put the ball back in your court. Uh, Okay, uh, maybe like your, your whole thing is, oh, he doesn't have perspective because I have to work a real nine to five. Well, at, when when five o'clock rolls around, guess what? You get to go home and be with your family, and you know, like being a dad or a mother, like I'm, that's very difficult as well. But there's an end to your day. A lot of days during the season, it is wake up, fucking roll out of bed, shower, get out, and work starts the second that you dry off your ass, and the second that your day's over at one o'clock in the morning. Time to go to bed and do it all over again. And Jake, Jake is the same way. Like Jake's got to do all this fucking shit too. Only when, when my work day ends at 1 a.m., he's then got to edit the podcast. So his day is even longer sometimes. So that's like there. I'm not looking for sympathy or woe is me or boohoo, but you can have your perspective argument right back. So that's it. It is what it is. But let's talk about baseball. <laughs> because just did 35 minutes on 
just the no, I mean, it had to be said because I I just like some of the stuff that was being said was just so bullshit. Like I wasn't just going to like take it and have that be an existing narrative. I'm glad that that topic took up time because I mean, that was one of the conversations we were having before we came on was do we even cover these games? <laughs> like, like, do people I still think- care? I think if, if things happen. Like, like Tristan Koss is having a good series. Adam Duvall, like, like you can, there are things to highlight, uh, but you can't, there's not a whole lot to take from them because the playoff implications and God bless, I don't even know who it was. God bless whoever had the pregame on WEI today because that individual had to sit there and act like there was a chance. Like he had to be like, well, you know, if they just go fucking 27 and three. <laughs> Rockies 2007, baby. Like, run oh, it back. my God, I felt so bad. Like, it's the Red Sox, like official, like network. So this poor bastard's got to sit there and do the math on what the Red Sox have to do to get in and act like there's a well, you know, these are the series that they got to take care of. So if they can just uh, if they can just win the series against the Royals, that they're they get their doors blown off in the first game. So if they just win this series against the Royals, well, then they got to sweep the Rays and then they got to sweep this team that's really good. And then they got to kick the Orioles ass there in first place. It's just like, all right, bro, like it's OK to have a longer outlook right now because that's what this is, podcast is going to be. And I even there was a point where I was so fucking pissed off reading some of that stuff where I was like, you know what? Because we I think we did this. I can't remember what year it was, but there was a year that we didn't do section 10 in the month of October. I think it might've been 20. Maybe it was 20, but there was a, there was a postseason where we were just like, all right, the Red Sox season's over. We'll pick it back up in the off season. And I was debating whether or not we were going to do that. And then I read all that shit and I was like, you know what? Fuck that. Like I'm, I'm, I'm going to play out September and then fuck October. And then I came back and I was like, you know what? No, fuck you. <laughs> fuck you. <laughs> I'm up. not going to do that because I, I, I'm i sticking to the point of I'm not going to let stupid ass comments dictate what I want to do. I want to continue doing the podcast. I think that there's a lot to be said and a lot to discuss. And the plan that I had talked to you guys about was, all right, we're going to have like September is going to suck. Stick with this if you can. It's going to fucking suck. We're going to grind through September. But once we get to October on this show, Lou's coming off the road. Will Fleming's coming off the road. Kevin Euclid, Dave O'Brien. Like, I want to get the people that were on the panel. And every episode that we do for, for this podcast until the offseason starts, I want to do like a season in review. What did you think? Where do you think that they're going? Like, we can get all these people's opinions before the offseason starts and I think that people would really enjoy that. So no, I'm not going to take October. I'm not going to take my ball and go home. I'm going to try and make this the the best Red Sox content that we've gotten in quite some time. And I think the part of this is in this whole conversation, it relates to everything we've talked about today. While the complaints and the stuff that comes out, that is not the majority. The majority of people that show love and appreciation and are always talking about how this podcast gets them through. Like, I feel bad going through a month of October and us not giving that to them, right? Because for a lot of these people, it is Red Sox all the time like it is for us. And they want that content even when there's no games to be played. And the only shit you hear being talked about is like, who's going to get a qualifying offer? What's going to happen with this move? Here's the little details leaking out from the end of the season. It all factors in. And I think going into October, this is arguably as important of an October going into an offseason as there's been in recent memory where... Who knows? Some of the rumors that were flying around, we're going to talk David Stearns today. There could be a lot of things happening in the month of October that change everything we've talked about this year and everything we're going to talk about moving forward. Yeah. There, yeah. There's uh, the Red Sox newsy items are going to be, they're going to be in. It's going to be less about the games, the box scores, and more about what the fuck do we do? How do we Big do picture. it? Who's going to do it? Some who, what, where, why? How? When? When? When's a great question. Um, is that where you want to start? Do you want to start with the uh, the David Stern stuff? I don't know. I think we should wrap. I think that should be closer to the end. I don't know. I feel like. Do you? I don't know. I, I, if you're a Red Sox fan right now, maybe you're still watching. Maybe you're still watching the games. Maybe you're not. I think the more important topic of discussion is like you're looking long term. And you can't really look long term without knowing who's going to make those decisions. 
Am I wrong? So th- that's a fair point. So we can start there. I have the quote in front of me from Bob Nightingale this morning. He had put out a column for those who didn't read it. It was like 20 notes on different shit across the league. Just, you know, oh, this, that, things. It's a notes column on all the rumors he's hearing. Uh, and this was from Nightingale. Former Milwaukee Brewers GM David Stern still is the heavy favorite to become the new president of baseball operations for the Mets. We all know they've cleared out their front office the last couple of days in a lot of ways outside of Billy Epler. He said, although rumors persist that the Boston Red Sox could still be in the mix. In either scenario, GM Billy Epler will stay with the Mets. So that's as big of a name as you're going to hear out here. We've talked David Stearns very little, I think, on this podcast. Maybe I'm thinking more of the baseball hour mm. where there's been some rumors. But over the course of the last call it year or so when these conversations have happened, there's been two reports. It's this one on David Stearns and there was a Brian Sabian one way ago. back yeah. in like April that came out of hold on, I have it in my notes right here when I was kind of that big time cooled the Brian uh, Jim ba- Yeah, Jim Bowden had it way back then and like saying that. Both, both of those sources are a little uh, let's just say unreliable. Like they're they're not all right. Uh, here's here's how I'll word it. They're not always rock solid. Cause I Bob Nightingale, roommate of mine. <laughs> and <laughs> and uh where was that? Seattle? Yeah, when we were in Seattle for the All-Star game, he was in the hotel room next to mine. We shared a wall. We shared a wall. That's a bond that uh not many people ever get to experience with each other. So what'd I, you hear? Was he just like slamming chicks? Like, what's going on with Bob Nightingale? No, I, I, I believe he's married. He, oh, if it, gentleman, if it's his wife, I met his wife. Lovely woman. Okay. Yes. All right. So, so they were slamming. Yeah, I'm assuming he looked. Uh, you were he listening. Looked, he looked dapper. And what was the dehydration level? Dehydration. Well, that's how you can tell us a male's been. Oh, you know. Well, he doing mean, his he thing. was like wearing a suit and. Yeah, he looks you very don't dress dapper. classy unless you're kind of doing the damn maybe, thing. Maybe it's a night on the town. I don't know. Hmm. But either way, uh, it was uh, he was the um, he was the source for the David Stearns report. And then Brian Sabian was a while ago. Um, there's a name that I want to float. Was this mentioned in the text chain? I don't know. Was it? I don't know if the response from Coley was like you were going to say it and then you just chose not to after. Oh, yeah. No, I didn't say it. Yeah, I. I, Yeah, I wanted to say it. And then Coley guessed himself. And then I went along with it. But there was a name that I wanted to drop in there. But I didn't say it. I don't think. Right. I'd love to hear it. No. It's a long shot. But, you're I not gonna, but I don't it's a long shot. But you're not going to do this, but I don't think it's zero percent. I don't think it's zero percent. Go ahead. Do you know who I'm going to say? I, I hope you're not going to say what I well, you know, in a fantasy, I would. But there's no way you're going to drop a Theo on us. a Theo Epstein. Stop Tyler. It, Stop Tyler. It. Hey, really? Hey. Not not zero percent. It's a long shot. <laughs> it's a long shot. But that's this is going to be all over Twitter. You, uh, you, you just, just did it. I mean, it's just it's 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 not zero percent. It's it's a small per, it's a small small percentage. But I'm just saying, like his name should be in the in the hat, should it not? Uh, if Theo would even fucking you know answer, not even answer the phone, would he let the phone ring? Would you still have the phone number? That'd be incredible. And we know Theo like. Personally, for me, I've looked at it and I'm always thinking, well, he's going to be the commissioner of baseball one day. That's kind of what he's done here. But wow. So you're telling me that door could still be open after all this time, after, you know, all the ups and downs over the years, obviously him going to Chicago and it never seemed like there was significant bad blood there or anything like that. But coming back to be boss or coming back to Boston would be quite a quite a it's a long shot. 360, right? It's a long shot. It's a long shot. It is. Long shot. Now, my question would be, so that name fits in with the same theory or outlook I've kind of had on this, where I think, you know, Stearns fits into this, where I think even Brian Sabian can because of the name alone. Is the conversation about Bloom possibly not coming back after this year if they can go get the big fish? 
If they can go and find the guy, the name that's going to drop headlines where there's no conversation, like you're not going to hire another prodigy in the making like Hein Bloom was, right? Like Hein Bloom was someone that got kind of turned down through a couple jobs, was always talked about as the guy. Like he will get a big job one day and we'll kind of see how it plays out. Do, are uh, they looking at more of that legit big name that they can pull in and be like, dude, we're dropping our hand on the fit or on the table. And this is going to be one of the, you know, one of the biggest headlines of an all of baseball going into the off season. Let me just say this. I have to be, I have to be very careful about <laughs> the wording of a lot of this. Uh, I'm not saying that I know more than most. I'm just saying that there, uh, people are talking. People, people who who know things or would know things, uh, smart people that are in in the in the realm that they're around. Um, they're talking, and wh- let me just let me put it to you like this. Let's just say hypothetically, the Red Sox do hire, which is again, I I, I think that even even David Stearns is a long shot. I feel like he could, you know be Mets bound, whatever. But let's just use his name because it'd be a shocker if he wasn't with the Mets at this point. Yeah, I agree. But let's just say for the sake of the debate, because his name is in the news and it's relevant Um, because he the fact that he's being linked to the Red Sox at all leads you to believe that the Red Sox are at least in the market for someone in that role. If the Red Sox were to hire someone like David Stearns. I don't necessarily believe that that means that Heim is out. Right? Does that make sense that, to you? That would be a very hard... Like, we kind of saw a similar way this was done with Ben Charrington, right? When Dave Dombrowski was bought, yeah, brought Frank in and they Wren, told, But, like, Frank Wren. Like, remember that? Yeah, but I think there is something to the point of, well, Heim Bloom, you, you are the big boss. We're bringing someone in who's now going to be higher on the food chain. It's a demotion. You may still have the title. Whatever title they may come up with to give, call it Stearns, call it Theo, call it whoever it may be. It, it would be a demotion going into the final year of a contract. It depends, on, it dep- depends on what Stearns' job title is, right? Yeah, but at the end because of the people, day... Brian O'Halloran is still the general manager of the Boston Red Sox. Heim Bloom is the chief baseball officer. The Red Sox just made that up. <laughs> like that is just like a made up job title because they wanted to keep BOH and they have three assistant general managers. They've got uh, Raquel. They've got Eddie. And who am I forgetting? Mike Grootman. He's one of the assistant GMs from, okay. so they've got, from Milwaukee. And that was one of the things we talked about all last year, too, about too many cooks in the kitchen. Like how many people have decision-making ability under the Red Sox umbrella. Like, I'm not saying it's a good thing. I'm not saying it's a bad thing if if they were to bring in, uh, if it's not David Stearns, but David Stearns type. And you keep Heim because you got to give Heim credit, right? Like, Heim, and this is one of the things they were saying (coughs) saying on the pregame today. Heim did a lot of the hard part. Like, Heim built up your farm system and he's not solely responsible for that, but it was under his watch. Uh, Heim built up your farm system. You go from dead last to fifth. And then he finds some diamonds in the rough, like a Garrett Whitlock. And you can keep talking about the examples. There are some misses too. No one's going to sit here and suck Heim's dick. Like that's not happening. But you can acknowledge, like there. I feel like in the world of Heim Bloom, there's too much one end of the spectrum or the other. You either it's extremist both you ways. You either think that he walks on water or you're like, fire this guy into the sun. It's okay to be somewhere in the middle because that's that's where I am and I'm not fence sitting. I get accused of that all the time. I got a tweet this morning that I responded to. Oh, you're on John Henry's payroll. Of course, you're going to say, after I tweeted about Tristan Casas at the time, had the fifth highest uh, OPS in the American League. Oh, make sure John Henry sees this because you're on his payroll. Uh, uh, Nesson is a side job. DraftKings is my job. I work for DraftKings. That's my job. They don't tell me what I can and can't say. And with Heim Bloom, you don't have to either hate the guy or love the guy. I, for me, <laughs> love him personally. I think he's a great guy. Uh, as far as a, a, a baseball person, there have been some missteps. Missteps that he has acknowledged. And I've had conversations with him about these missteps. I go back to the trade deadline last year and not getting into the luxury tax. We reference that all the fucking time. 
And he'll tell you point blank. We should have handled that entirely differently. Like, that's not something that he's standing by and being like, nope, uh, you know, we we did that because of reasons X, Y and Z. Like, he'll sit there and tell you, like, yeah, we probably fucked that one up. You know, like that's that's the the, the matter of it all. But I think when when you evaluate Heim Bloom, uh, when I talked about, you know, the, the hard part, the building back up of the farm system, the finding guys in the rough, the plugging some of the holes on the roster, all that's great. But you need someone like a Theo Epstein. I'm not saying it's, it's not an insult to Heim. It's a compliment to Theo Epstein as the example. You need someone like Theo Epstein that has the balls to trade a Nomar Garcia Parra uh, in the middle of what ends up being a championship season. I don't think that like if, if you could go back in time and pluck Heim from 2023 and plop him in 2004, does Heim make that trade? Absolutely not. I don't think that there's a fucking... Ch- I don't even think he considers it. I don't think that they even make the phone call. I, it's, I, I it's, think- it's, it's having conviction and it's, 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 it's going out and making a trade that there's a chance you might lose it. it. There's risk involved. I think that Heim... And I've said this before. I think that Heim is only going to make a deal that he feels like he can win. And you can't, you can't build a team like that. There needs to be risk. There needs to be risk. Oh, there was a there was huge Theo Epstein's talked about it all the time. He's like, yeah, like I they would have like cut my head off if if we didn't win the World Series that year or if things went south and we didn't make the playoffs. We traded Nomar Garcia Parra. Like I would have been enemy number one in the city of Boston forever <clears throat> if that didn't work out. Now he's a legend. Like that's the difference. And that's I think what what Heim's repertoire is lacking is nuts on the table type moves. Have we, in your opinion, Tyler, has, has high made one? Nuts on the table move. No, I think we're still waiting for that Chris Sale S trade where you push your chips in. You're willing to say, here are some of the main parts of my farm system. I'm mortgaging, you know, call it Yoan Mankata, Michael Kolpik at the time, these pieces and saying, guess what? The fucking window's wide open. This is our time to fucking win it. We haven't had that. Now, will I say some of the money he's handed out? I don't think he gets enough credit for the Trevor Story stuff. Like that was a contract, the Masataki Yoshida. Like there's been moments, even the Rafael Devers extension with his back against the wall having to do it. But we're waiting for that move that signals the opening that we're serious. This is our chance to win. We're not just trying to be in the conversation. We are the conversation. And that's what we're hoping for this offseason. I just look at it from the standpoint of here in this organization, you have BOH who serves as the GM, right? Yeah. Bloom gets the title above it. Chief baseball officer basically on the same tier and viewed as the same tier as the president of baseball operations. You are the guy, the lead title, whatever it may be. If you were to bring in another name to kind of do that, like a Theo or like a David Stearns, whoever it is, I'd have a hard time believing that Heim would be sticking around in that situation because it's a demotion no matter which way you put it. And some people say, well, look at Billy Epler. Billy Epler has been through the fucking ringer the last couple of years with jobs and changing with opportunities and stuff like that. This was Heim Bloom's shot. Like this was his job. When he got it, he got that five-year deal. It was like, all right, we know this is going to take time, but you know, this is going to be my organization to run. The reason I'm here, I got recommendations from fucking Theo Epstein to have this job, right? Like this is how you guys are viewing me. You're hoping that I'm, a, I'm on this ilk. I'd have a hard time believing. I think you're picking between one or the other. If you're bringing in one of those major names. Uh, I really do. Now, do I think the rest of the front office as a whole, BOH and some of those other names, I think those could very, you know, fairly stick around because they did through the Dave Dombrowski to Heim Bloom era. But at that point, I wouldn't be surprised if Heim's on his way out. I have a hard time envisioning all those kind of names sticking together in one. And a lot of people will go out there and say, well, I like Heim as a farm director. I like Heim as that. I don't think Heim's in that business. I don't think he's looking at that at this point. And I think even if he were to leave here after this year, I do think there'd be organizations interested in bringing him in in a significant role. Would it be another GM role or something to that level right away? But I'd expect him more to continue down that path. I just him sitting under a Theo or David Stearns. That's hard for me to believe. Yeah, I don't know. Do you would do you think he'd stay Heim? Yeah. Under one of those guys. It's a demotion. Under uh, under a Theo, maybe. M- maybe you could justify Theo as like the, you know, ho- no one's better than Theo. He, like, he's the GOAT. We all look at him as the GOAT. You can maybe accept that. But even still, like, we all know 
they're taking your keys away, Heim. Like that you're no longer the guy who's making that final call and making that deal. Like that's just not your position. Hey, you may do all these same things. You may have a lot of responsibility, but it's not your direction anymore. It's the guy above you. Uh, it's a, it's an you're admitting that you can't do the job. That's what the Red Sox will be saying by hiring someone else to go ahead of him. That's a hard thing to accept as an employee, in my opinion. I like Ben Sherrington didn't even fucking think about it. He told them, fuck you. That correct. And he was probably right about that. <laughs> you know, it took him. Ben a Sherrington while did have a World Series as well. He did. He did. And he was he was in the um, uh, he was in the organization for a long time. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, I think a couple of weeks ago when I was having this conversation with Maz <clears throat> being like, and even, even on the podcast that we did after the trade deadline. And I said, I'm not out on Heim, but it's a make or break off season. It, it never really crossed my mind that he n- may not get the off season. Well, I think to a lot of us, we all looked at it as, Hey, the expectation for this year where you're not over the luxury tax based how they handled the trade deadline and there wasn't the urgency to significantly improve the team, even leading up to the deadline with Sam Kennedy saying the same thing. Like if we're talking consistent messaging, right? Like Sam Kennedy and Al's core were telling you a week before the deadline, people aren't going to agree with what we do or, you know, we're really focused on the injured players coming back. It seemed to all paint the picture here of what this year was supposed to be, right? Like this was our expectation. This is kind of where we are. My question would just be, do they look at Heimblum? Do they look at the overall process here? And, you know, most people, I think, who are being fair, it's around a C plus B minus grade, depending on where you want to be in this. It, you know, he hasn't wowed like you hoped in certain areas. He has like the farm system. I think some of the, you know, small spending signings, finding guys like Gary Whitlock and Bernardino and Schreiber, you've seen him really excel, even building the bullpen this year. Major su- success in that front. But we've seen the limitations with the pitching staff defensively like you are a historically bad defensive team this year and this has been a problem for years like there's no running around it and say it what way you want there's been a disconnect with the clubhouse that's continued to leak out at times and not look great and make it look like you and Alex Cora aren't always on the best terms either which is not a good look for any organization where he is saying things like Pablo Reyes is an everyday player there's been subtle shots each way but I think that's why they probably look at it if they can get a major fish where there's no conversation where you say, dude, Heim Bloom, Theo, get the fuck out. Bloom, like <laughs> we'll pack your bags for you and drive you to the airport. That's what it is. David Stearns, I'd put, you know, multiple tiers above Heim Bloom. David Stearns, in a lot of ways, was one of the most respected nerds in all of baseball for what he did in Milwaukee. And there's certain things on that resume, which I do think there are fair to criticize. You talk about having a bad trade deadline. Do we need to relive 2022 for the Brewers? I remember the deal that legit fucking killed his team that year. Like, that's a fair conversation. And even I will tell you, if you made me pick between David Stearns and Heim Bloom, I'm, I'm leaning David Stearns. I, I have a hard time not doing that. But I think the other side of it is, do you think some of this stuff with David Stearns is him trying to raise the price up on the Mets? Where there's still all this stuff happening, you know, we don't have anything confirmed yet. And David Stearns has been out of baseball. It's not like he's multitasking, doing multiple jobs here. Is that part of why we're seeing this the first week of September? <sighs> Jake, where are you at on this? Should should Heim Bloom be given this offseason? I think he gets one more offseason to give us what we've been talking about, that big splash that everyone's been waiting for. I think if it doesn't happen this offseason, then a lot more people are going to be on the fire bloom train. Mm. And I, I, that's where I'd kind of lean to where I think if you can't find like the obvious, clear, like, holy shit move, to like get rid of him or move him out, then is it really worth it? And even with David Stearns, can you say, well, we don't know what he looks like with a big market. Wasn't like he won in Milwaukee, like to a world series, what it was four playoff appearances in seven years. He got with win within one game of the world series, right? Hein Bloom got to an ALCS in 2021. I know people forget and don't want to act like that didn't happen. He did. Like, I don't look at David Stearns and say, is that as much of a sure bet? I still think like, Damn, I think he's one of the best nerds to come out. Hein Bloom just hasn't yet shown that he's on even the David Stearns like tier to me. There's a reason why teams. Do you believe that he's talking. redundant? 
David Stearns and Bloom. Yeah. Yeah, I think they're very similar. That's, and I think that's where I land. I, I think where I ultimately land on this is if you're going to move on from Heim, it better be an upgrade like a Theo Epstein. Like you can't risk like, all right, we don't want this nerd. We want to bring another nerd <laughs> because while Stearns has has uh, built up quite a pitching staff there in Milwaukee, uh, he's also made some questionable deals. Um. Christian Yelich's contract. Yep. Be careful what you wish for. You know, I mean, Yelich is having a nice little bounce back year this year, but he's definitely not going to live up to the. And he took a hometown discount, too, which was nice. But it was like 200. And, it was like basically the price contract. It was like 215 million, something like that, uh, with a lot of deferred money because Milwaukee doesn't have the money to pay him up front. But um, that's kind of where I'm at is. I think in kind of asking around, you know, hearing it in one place being surprised that there are some people that don't think that Heim will make it uh, past November, like su- being surprised to hear that and then kind of asking around other people like, hey, what do you think about this? And some people feel that way. I, my impression was that this was a make or break off season for him. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. Like that wasn't my read on it. My read was always that uh, ownership was... Like, I know the ownership wasn't happy about the past trade deadline. But unhappy enough to where the guy would build up the farm system to fifth and be like, all right, see you later. I didn't I didn't get that sense. But maybe maybe that's where we're at. I don't know. Or maybe maybe they're uh, because what what my kind of response to it was. You can't you don't have time to conduct a search if you have someone lined up. That you're like, this is the guy and we're going to announce Himes out. This guy's in on the same fucking day. That's a different argument. But this is too important of an offseason to be spending more than 24 hours searching for who's going to be the person, uh, man or woman, that is going to be making the decisions that build the, the, the Red Sox future. Like, we don't have time for that. And it would feel like we would have started to hear more of the leak. You know what I mean? Like when we talk about it's twice nationally, we've heard it, you know, in a season, we're talking six months, nothing locally, everything kind of locally pointing in the other direction. And say what you will, even the biggest high bloom haters, a majority of them are saying, yeah, I expect bloom to be back because that's the way ownership's handling it. Yada, yada, yada. So I think bloom being out in general would be a shock to everyone. I like I think Theo, obviously, like you, if that's even. One percent. And if it somehow happens, you don't even have the conversation. It's like, sorry, Heim. David Stearns, I think you have the conversation. You talk about it. But yeah, I, I circle back to the point. It's just like. Do you view David Stearns as just a, another nerd or do you view him as a special nerd that you give him a legit payroll and he's going to turn into one of these studs like an Andrew Friedman or whatever it is? I look at David Stearns. and I think that's possible. So that's why I would have the convo. But I still feel like. Heim did what he had to do this year to keep his job. And at this point, I'd see it through the final year. And I, I still expect that. I, would you still say that's your expectation? <clears throat> um, like w- if you gave me a percentage, would you say 60% Heim Bloom's back? I don't know. It's hard, wow. man. That, if, that's if, serious. If, if you would ask me that question last week, I would say. 75% chance that Heim's back. <clears throat> uh, people smarter than me don't feel that way. I don't know what their percentages are. I don't know. Like if I were to ask them like, hey, you know, you didn't seem super confident that Heim would be back. What percentage would you put on him being back? I don't know what that number is. Because if you had asked me last week before having any of those conversations, I would have felt very confident. I mean, like, yeah, why wouldn't he be back? Like, especially the point that we've been making all fucking year. Yeah, they missed the playoffs, but if they win 87 games, isn't that where they were projected to be? Actually, they were projected to be right where... Yeah, they were supposed to win 77 games, right? So like... That that was the over-under. Yeah, if you you win 10 more games than you were projected to win, how how are you going to be like, hey, thanks, thanks, but no thanks? So it's hard. I mean, that's why my stance is that if you're going to move on from Heim, the next guy, it, he's got to be a slam dunk. 
Like it's got to be. Would you think about David Stearns? I don't like. I don't think that David Stearns is a slam dunk. I think the fact that he has been able to develop pitching to the level that he has. Like, how many years have we been talking about what will it take to get uh, Brandon Woodruff? What will it take to get Corbin Burns? Have you seen uh, Devin Williams change up? <laughs> you know, like, like the the pitching that developed under his watch in Milwaukee is nothing short of amazing. Like they're some of the best pitchers in the league, but. And, and and when people, Maz, push back on the Red Sox having the fifth best farm system in baseball, they'll say, yeah, well, they shouldn't be that high because they don't have any pitching. Do you think that that's a fair criticism? Because I do. Uh, I do. Yeah, I, I would say they're definitely still top 10. I think people try to discredit and act like last year when fucking Keith Law put him 23rd, like that's legit. But I'd also go and tell you, all right, yeah, you're very position player heavy. Use those fucking assets. They're still assets. You can go get the pitching you want. Like you have the prospects, go do something with them. Like we've talked about them being able to do. You can go get a young controlled starter. You just have to pay the price. Like that's what it's going to come down to here. Now, Brian Bayo for Dylan Cease, fuck no. But we're talking, you know, over the off season when things aren't crazy, you can have a real conversation and figure some of this stuff out. You have enough to get a deal done. There's no reason why you can't at this point. Um, And I I think with the Heim Bloom conversation as well, it's not only the fact that they're going to end up in that win range. It's the stuff that you saw happen in front of you. The Jaron Durans, the Tristan Casas, the young core moving forward, Masataki Yoshida coming in and being a legit player. Now, how high you think his ceiling is? Fair question. He's clearly run down. He looks better right now. Core says he's being rested. You know, he start, he's starting to feel better. We saw with that homer today. But you see with the Red Sox, it's not 85 wins and, oh, shit, how are they going to sustain this? It's, all right, no, they're building up. You see a young core that's very easy to visualize and imagine if you pair them with what they need, they can compete next year with, just about any team in baseball or at least be in the conversation for, you know, a division title, hopefully. But yeah, I, I, it's a it's a hard convo, but I'm, I'm not looking for Bloom to get flipped for the next Bloom, right? right? I think the conversation would be, well, Bloom is winning 85, 86 games here and he's doing it up to the luxury tax. David Stearns in Milwaukee was doing that with much less. Yeah, very it, different circumstances, though, right? Like what they came into. People want to act like Kyle Bloom walked into fucking flowers because Mookie Betts was on his team. He wasn't. And I, I know me and Coley were going back, back and forth on this last episode, where it's like, well, just attach David Price to someone else, dude. You realize Mookie Betts thirty million is also on the books, right? right. Like that's amazing. Like it's great to say, oh, you could have traded David Price's contract anywhere. Mookie Betts was making fucking thirty million. It wasn't sixteen million. It was forty-two fucking million. Mm-hmm. Like it, that's legit money, dude. Like that is not something you flip and you say, well, you trade this guy anywhere. You know what it takes to trade contracts? Prospects. What was your farm system? It was 30th. Like, <laughs> yeah. like connect the fucking dogs. Like, that's all I'm trying to say here. Yeah. Like, it's easy to say certain things and act like, oh, well, you just do this. You just do that. It wasn't that fucking easy. It really wasn't. You don't think they went through every possible way to figure out those deals beforehand. Um, and there were ways there are ways to go about it differently. There's no denying that. But I, I think that's what you'd look to and why people dream on David Stearns to the level they do, where he had that success in a small market as the guy. Say what you will about Heim Bloom. He wasn't the guy in Tampa. He was working under the guy, and you hoped he would be the next guy to evolve into one of those. So far, you mean Andrew Freeman? Yeah, Andrew Freeman, Eric Neander, name whoever you want to fucking name. In reality, he's more like Farhan Zaidi right now, where, all right, like, you're good. Like, you, you're solid. You've shown some things, but, but even, are you even in the same Farhan tier? Farhan Zaidi threw the bag at Aaron Judge, and, like, they were in on And that's Bryce the Harper. difference, right? Like, begging. That, that's begging a huge to take fucking a deal. difference. Like, building up a farm system is awesome. The Red Sox haven't had that in a long time. They haven't had someone come in and, and be like, hey, uh, we're going to we're gonna draft and develop and, and create stars. It, like that was what Theo Epstein did. But Theo Epstein also had the balls to make the big trade. And he went out there and I mean, go read Feeding the Monster. If you if if you're a younger baseball fan right now and you're like, who's Theo Epstein? Why would I want Theo Epstein? Go read Feeding the Monster. Come back to me next episode and tell me how bad you want the Epstein because you're going to do anything like he was the dude that if you know, when the when the Yankees wanted Jose Contreras and then the Red Sox wanted Jose Contreras and he saw that the Yankees fucking signed him and he didn't. He took a chair and smashed it in the Red Sox front office like that's the fire that you need. And I'm not saying that Heim doesn't have fire. I think he cares. I think Heim cares a lot. I think he wants to win here, but there needs to be that conviction and that go for it mentality 
that we haven't seen yet. And it it be it would be unfair to say that Heim doesn't possess it. But we also can't sit here and say that we know that he does because we don't know that. We haven't seen and it and we've been I, waiting I, for it. Which is ownership. why I think it would be unfair to, unless it's Theo, it would be unfair to be like, you know what? Thanks for building this farm system back up and putting us in a position where <clears throat> we could go out and have a big off season and be right back in this bitch next year. But we're not even going to see if you'll push the right buttons. We're actually just going to, we're going to move on right now. And I think with Davis Stearns, you also fall in the convo like, Everything lines up for that guy to want to be in the Mets. It's where he's from. I know he went to Harvard, right? Like you can say, oh, I went to Yale, right? David Stearns, this has been in the making for over a year. When Steve Cohen went there, everyone was like, all right, how's this going to play out? Obviously, he plays the whole game. Matt Arnold takes over in Milwaukee and all this stuff. It feels like that's the match made in heaven. So like, I have a hard time believing that's not going to happen when everything they're doing is lining up to that. Right. That I think the Red Sox, they're dipping their toe and saying, if we can just we're willing to listen, if it's a great all time name that we value amongst the very best in the sport. I think that's how David Stearns is viewed. And I have a hard time. I can't really compare what him and Haim have done because they're just working with completely different tools. Um, and, and like that's the reality. And credit to David Stearns. He's worked with a lot less and had, you know, similar to better success, uh, arguably. Right. But it, it's different circumstances. I just. I still think Haim is going to be here. I'd be very surprised if he wasn't. But I think ownership told you last offseason through some of the reports that leaked out straight to June Lee. There are questions with Haim Bloom about whether he can pull that move off. People in that front office that are not or not ownership that maybe work with him wonder, does he have the balls to make those moves? And you have to make the move at some point. I think that's why end of year. Like they need such a concrete plan of this is our fucking guy or these two are our guys. This is the plan. We're getting after it. There's no in between. There's no conversation about it at all. Like we are balls to the wall going in. If it's not that, then I don't know. Maybe maybe they're waiting to hear what his view is in some way. I just it doesn't make much sense to me because like you said, you can't go into the offseason not knowing where you're going here. You need to know from day fucking one, day one, if you're going to get this team where it needs to go. I mean, it's not a foreign concept, right? Like they had Alex Cora pretty much lined up. They fired John Farrell. Here's Alex Cora. Like they it, they do make decisions like these in advance. They fired Dave Dombrowski in, in September to line up uh, the Heimblum era. What, like a month later or whatever? October 25th. OK, so about a couple of months, a month and change later. But the only reason why that was a situation where it, it wasn't immediate is, is he probably had to decide, like, am I going to go to the Mets? But he had options. I'm sure Alex Cora had options as well, but he had a preference and it was Boston. If that was an option, then it's like, all right, yeah, of course I'm going to Boston. Um, so it's and people. Different. And when it came to Heim Bloom, Heim Bloom was Boston's preference. That was the guy they had circled. That was the guy they wanted. That's what they dreamed on. They were hoping he was going to be a version of Theo. Like you're, you're getting this guy who's going to be able to be the ultimate communicator, the blender of analytics. You know, he's been with the Rays all these years. Now you give him the payroll. Watch what the fuck happens. He's going to become a dog. And through the ups and downs, there haven't always been dog moments. It's just, yeah, that's what it is. But the Red Sox had their eyes set on Heim Bloom. If they're already starting to have these conversations here, it's like you're not looking at a big philosophy change. Like if you bring David Stearns in, that's Correct. the difference there. That's it's why just, it can't happen. Like you, if you're going to move on from Heim, it has to be a, a complete philosophy change. Bringing in David Stearns and moving on from Heim, it really like it's like, all right, uh, we are not signing Joey Gallo, uh, but we are looking to sign Kyle Schwarber. It's like, well, what? <laughs> like the same yeah. type of player. I mean, well, not entirely, no, because Joey Gallo at least has gold glove uh, defense, but it's not a perfect comparison. But you know what I'm trying to say? It's like there's not a complete abandonment from one player to the next, from one executive to the next. Like It has to be. Uh, if it ain't Theo, I'm not interested in, in the end of the high era. And I think the other thing that you run the risk of, right? Is what if the guy after Heim 
Like you start to see the prospects that you were excited about, they don't pan out. The Red Sox start to have shitty draft. Like there's an entirely ironic universe that exists down the road where fans are like, ah, maybe we shouldn't have been so hard on Heim. Like I miss the Heim era. I miss when the Red Sox had a top five uh, <laughs> farm system. Like you know, because it's a very, it's a very fickle universe to be in the the baseball talent evaluation world. Uh, a lot of us pretend like we know what we're talking about. Very many, very few people actually do. You know, there's a reason those guys are in the front office, and you know we're doing a podcast, right? Like right. that's the difference. And, there. and fans on Twitter, like the like people just like acting like they know better than everyone else. Really, no one has a good idea. Like if you go back and look at some of the, uh, you know, Red Sox top ten prospects of 2009 you look at the list and you're like most of these guys suck <laughs> you know it, it, it's a hard game right and then you look at someone like the astros and you say what the fuck like look yeah. at what they were able to build i i think the philosophy that's what happens when little... you get the first round fucking first yeah. overall pick for nine straight years <laughs> just keep tanking and i i think there is something with the philosophy though and old school baseball fans aren't going to like this it's going to be a nerd nerds are the only thing that's left in a majority of sports but especially baseball, there's only one Dave Dombrowski for a reason, man. You know what I mean? Like that ilk of people, of kind of guys, the old school way. And who is Dave Dombrowski's right hand man? Do you know, Jared, off the top of your head? Dave Dombrowski's right hand man in Philadelphia? Yep. Uh, I don't. Sam Fold. Oh, who, yeah. Who was linked <laughs> to the Red Sox. And is analytically to the fucking moon. Well, like, he, but, but he was a player. Right, but, but they anal- wanted Sam Fold guy. to be the manager. Yes, in Boston. Yeah, that wasn't like but, a front office gig. No, but what I'm saying is even an old school guy like Dave Dombrowski, his right hand guy is someone who's extremely analytical to the point Heim Bloom wanted him or did, I'm not going to say wanted him, viewed him and Alex Cora as legit candidates that he had to consider to be his manager in Boston. That's the kind of thing there when people want to say, Dave Dombrowski could never view baseball the way Heim Bloom does. He'd laugh at that style of going about it. Well, no, even the old school guy needs an analytics guy to his right side who helps him through all this stuff and kind of his outlook of the entire game. So if you're hoping analytics are just not going to be a part of Boston's front office or anything like that moving forward, it's going to be some form of a nerd. And Theo's a nerd. Theo's the nerd, the OG nerd. So like that, that's the line you're walking here. I think obviously Theo, that's dream world. David Stearns, I'm having a conversation about it, um, but I don't. I just, I don't believe he's going anywhere but New York. I, I 100% believe he's going there, and I think they're lining all their ducks in a row for that to happen. And I think that's that's where he's from. Like, how many boxes can you fucking check off? When I was a uh, when I was your age, Tyler, <clears throat> talk to me. Even before that, actually, I was I was probably. Mm, 10 years, close to 10 years younger than you. So like 20 15. years ago. Yeah. Uh, on my Facebook profile, it said it had an option for religious views. And you know what my religious views were back then, Tyler? What? It said Theo Epstein. Mm. <laughs> That's I don't, it, so. How could anyone blame you? I what? mean, this I- is coming from one of the biggest, if not the biggest, Nomar fan to ever do it. That man traded my favorite player. I cried. I remember screaming like, this is worse than Babe Ruth. <laughs> like That was an actual thing that I said on July 31st, 2004. I said, this is worse than when the Red Sox traded Babe Ruth. And that was wrong. Theo Epstein... <laughs> Theo Epstein, I'll say it right now. <clears throat> he was smarter than me when I was 15. Really? Yes. Hot <laughs> I'm, take. I'm coming clean on it right now. He he knew what he was doing and I didn't. Because I and I I interviewed Dan Duquette in 2009. I could probably go find those interviews. Those would be fucking wild to listen to right now. Wild. I want to say I, get, I have some clips from that interview. I'll find them. I'll play them on the next name redacted episode. But I interviewed Dan Duquette in 2009. And I said, Dan, 
If you were the Red Sox general manager in 2004, tell me right now, would you have traded Nomar Garcia Parra? And he said, no. No, I would not have done that. So for as much credit as he does deserve for that 2004 World Series title, he does. A lot of his guys were on that team. Johnny Damon, Manny Ramirez, Pedro Martinez, some of the big ones. The engine. Jason Veritek, Derek Lowe, all Dan Duquette guys. Uh, he gets and he doesn't get enough credit for building 2004, but 2004 doesn't happen if he stays in the driver's seat because he is on the record as saying he would not have traded Nomar Garcia Parra. So I guess, Jared, I want to ask you, because I think a lot of people who listen to this podcast who are in my age range or even younger, Mm -hmm. like when Theo left after 2011 and all this stuff plays out here. You know, I, I was 13. So, like, I didn't have the the grasp of remember, everything going on. I remember on. the blog. What was your outlook when Theo departed Suicide. and all this played out? <laughs> I wanted How to did... kill myself. Dude, I w- I, that's, when I, <laughs> that's when I tried to go into the Marines. I was like, I would rather be in <laughs> Afghanistan than be here in this situation. So, when you're sitting here listening to this fucking podcast and I'm depressed and sad because the Red Sox aren't doing well... Just know that you're talking to the same motherfucker who tried to enlist in the Marines and go to the fucking desert because the Red Sox were bad. Like, that's who you're talking to. I understand my career is at a different place now than it was back then. I was living in my mom's basement. I didn't have a college degree yet. No one ever was like, hey, let's give this guy a job full time. Section 10 didn't exist yet. We didn't do the duck boats yet with Coley. None of that stuff had happened yet but you're still talking to the same brain. That brain is still in my fucking skull right now where I was like, oh, uh, I was in Baltimore. I remember the book. I'm a Pink Floyd fan. My favorite song is Comfortably Numb. The title of the blog after they were eliminated in 2011 was Uncomfortably Numb because that's how I fucking felt. I was in Baltimore when the collapse happened and I had fucking Orioles fans all in my face. And this is before anyone knew who I was. It was just like strictly he's wearing a Red Sox jersey. Like, let's get this motherfucker. And I I walked like, I don't know why we didn't get a cab. We walked back to the hotel. I had to walk the streets of Baltimore with my head down. Didn't lift my head up until I got into my hotel room and wrote that blog uncomfortably numb. That was the title of the blog. It was the last night of Tim Wakefield. It was the last night of Jason Veritek. It was the last night of Jonathan Papelbon. It was the last night of Terry Francona. And it was the last night of Theo Epstein. It was the ultimate end of an era moment. And I was at the epicenter of it. And then they followed that up with a last place season under a manager that everyone hated that the Boston media tried to make our most lovable players hateable. They came for Pedroia, my new favorite player post Nomar, Dustin Pedroia. They tried to make him out to be like he was the, the enemy number one. Kevin Euclid got fucking traded because he couldn't get along with, with Bobby Valentine. It was a nightmare. I tried to enlist in the Marines to get away from the situation. That's the motherfucker that you tune into every single series conclusion. So when I say, oh, man, I'm upset about the... This is not this is not wishy washy fucking we're not it's not a game. We're not it's not an act. This is not this is not some sort of character that I'm playing. That's how much I care about this fucking team. To go back to the point of the start of the show. So that was it was uh it was very hopeless, Tyler. To <clears throat> to go back to that night, it was about as hopeless of a feeling as you're going to get as a, you lose your captain, your manager, uh, Tim Wakefield, a pillar in the community. You lose your closer who was fun and bubbly and had this personality. And then you lose Theo Epstein, the architect of two World Series titles when you thought at the time that you were going to fucking die without seeing one. Think about how hopeless of a, of a position you're in when in just one Cole Crawford shitty ass attempt at catching uh what was his name? Fucking uh Felix Pae? No, no, um, no Joey fucking uh uh what was his name? Joey fucking Robert Bernardino. Was it Bernardino? Yep. And Dino. And Robert, Robert Andino. Andino. Robert Andino, a little dinky bloop into left, and and Carl Crawford can't catch it. Like all in one little bloop, it's all over. All of it. All of I- it. 
I will say that Carl Crawford attempt was one of the most pathetic attempts Terrible. I've ever seen it's, in my it's entire like, life. It's like, and you can relate to this, Tyler. You probably, this probably doesn't even like fit with you because it would be an exciting moment for you. But most normal people out there, it's like your dog's sick and you got to take him to the vet and then you put him on the table and they're like, all right, we'll take care of old Scruffy here. Bang. And then they blow his <laughs> fucking face off with a shotgun. That's what that felt Ooh. like. It's like, whoa, like every, your whole world just changes. Everyone, everything that you thought was going to bring you happiness in an instant, it's all gone and it's not coming back unless Theo comes back this winter. I don't know. I, I have questions. Yep. First off, when you were enlisting in the Marines, uh-huh. were you, did you get denied due to your, you know, your structure at the time? No. Uh, so I went and I took the physical test and mm-hmm. I passed that. Uh, I sat down with the recruiter. And we went over <clears throat> different jobs that you can do while you're in the Marines. Uh, and the reason why it did not happen was because uh, my mom wrote me a letter. Uh, I don't want to say begging me not to go, but like listing all the reasons why I shouldn't go. And it wasn't so much like this isn't for you. It was more like don't You'd give up it. your dream type deal. and. Yeah, it was more. I still have it. I still have the letter. Yeah, I, I don't think you would have done well. I think you would have done. No, I definitely would not have done well. No, I don't think so. Um, my my second question, I guess, on this overall, the fact that we're even having this conversation about the O mm-hmm. that you're I'm feeling it. You're letting yourself get like the littlest excited, right? About, like yeah. you're you're allowing yourself to dream. Is that just you being in a desperate state as a Red Sox fan here? And you're like, Dog, I just need to feel something. I don't even care if I have to fucking inject this 1% into me. And say, yeah, it is injecting maybe. the 1%, but it's not zero. Okay. I think it's more so that I'm, he still has ties around here. So I think it's it's almost like if there's smoke, please let it be an inferno. Like, I think if I were to read between the lines, and this is complete... I, I, Hand to God, I don't have any inside information on this outside of I've heard more than one person float his name as a possibility. But I think where it probably where stuff like this happens to where it gets to someone like me is maybe he was out to dinner one night and one of his friends was like, you should come back to be the Red Sox general manager. And he was like, yeah, that'd be cool. But I don't know. That's all it takes sometimes. And then I would and then that I would rip his clothes talks, off right and then, there. Then that guy talks to his buddy. He's like, hey, I was out with Theo last night and I actually he didn't, he didn't say no. And then that guy goes to work and he's like, bro, my buddy was out to dinner with Theo last night and he said you should come back to the socks. And he said, fuck, yeah. And then and then that guy's like, bro, Theo socks happening. Book it. D- does DraftKings have odds on the socks <laughs> bringing back Theo? Because I mean, right now it should be minus a thousand. He's coming back, dude. And that's how it happens. But it's all from like a moment that may have meant nothing. Like he may have never even thought about it again after it happened. Like that's how stuff like that happens. I'll throw into this conversation as well. A major thing we've heard about the Red Sox ownership and especially from Heim Bloom was building something sustainable and long term where they were sick of the ups and downs over that, you know, from Theo to Charrington to Dombrowski, like moving pieces, changing philosophies, doing all these different stuff all in this stretch. They wanted stability. Could you picture Theo being in this for a long time? And so in this job where he's already gone, you know, he did it in Chicago, twice in Boston. Yeah. Is that just like to expect him to commit to something like that for such a long time when there's talks of him being a commissioner one day and this stuff? Is that an unfair expectation to kind of expect out of him or hope for him? So I think Theo Epstein has one of the more memorable quotes um that i think i've ever kind of come across like doing this for a job um and it's always stuck with me i don't even know that you've ever heard it or that you're familiar with it or people listening to it are familiar with it but he was so transparent and so and i always appreciated that about him but i don't know that it always played into his favor because the, the the way that the subreddit comes at you when you say the term bridge year, they don't want to hear it. Theo Epstein in 2010 straight up called that year a bridge year. 
He's like, yeah, it's a bridge year. Fuck. What do, what do you want me to say? <laughs> right. And there is, and I'm paraphrasing. People miss that honesty. Uh, uh, they did it at the time, but now with Heim Bloom telling you it's going to be awesome, you miss when someone was that direct about something. Right. Right. But back then, Theo, and, and I don't remember the extent, of the, the full extent of the quote, but it was more just a term that he used. And he said, you know, everyone in this, in this, in this world, we have a shelf life talking about executives and managers. Um, he was talking about himself. He was talking about Terry Francona. He was probably talking about both of them at the same time, knowing like, hey, we've had a fucking great run, but we've all got a shelf life, you know? And, and I, that's always stuck with me, even with like someone like Alex Cora, uh, who I have so much love and respect for beyond just being a baseball manager, like as a person. And I have to keep in mind to like keep my feelings in check with AC because it's like everyone's got a shelf life. Like he's not going to be here forever. Uh, he may transition. Like, you know, we keep talking about like who's going to be the next general manager. I don't think that Alex Corner is going to be the next general manager, but I think that someday he might want to do something like that. Um, There's going to be a build up to that where he's probably going to have to work in, a, you know, sure. behind someone or maybe, you know, maybe Sam, maybe, maybe not. or something like that. Yeah, maybe something like that. Uh, but. Theo Epstein was very forward facing about like, hey, I know I have a shelf life here. Like you guys think that I walk on water because of 2004 and then we followed it up with another one in 2007. And this is all great, but I know I'm not here forever. Like I'm going to eventually have to move on. And he almost did in what was it? 2006. Yeah, it was it was the winter 05 going into 06 where he was like, fuck this. I'm out of here. That was like a year and change after 2004. So he on went, October, he, yeah, on October 31st, 2005, Epstein resigned, rejecting a three year, one and a half million per year contract for personal re personal reasons. He told the Globe, this is a job you have to give your whole heart and soul to. In the end, after a long period of reflection about myself and the program, I decided I could no longer put my whole heart and soul into it. And that's because of Larry Lucchino. Like he didn't want to he behind closed doors. The conversation went a little bit something like this. Larry, you're either going to have to fucking step aside or I'm out of here. He was like, you know, Larry is that fucking that that angry Italian that he wants it done and he wants it done the right way. And I miss that. We've talked about this before as it pertains to Sam Kennedy and needing that voice uh, at the at the front of the Red Sox Polar organization. Opposites. Yeah, like you need someone that has that fuck you. And Larry had that. He was a great uh, figurehead for the organization. But get out of Theo's way. Like you can go out there and call the Yankees the evil empire. And you can go out there and say, uh, you know, like this offseason, like we're going to get a closer. Keith Folk, like we're going to get an ace. Kurt Schilling, like we're going to like you can be the rah, rah guy that he. Larry Lucchino was the perfect Paul Heyman to Theo Epstein's Brock Lesnar. Theo didn't have to say a fucking word. He just went out there and he did his damage. And Larry could talk all the shit and keep the Red Sox in the newspapers because we know that they love that. That's more or less what happened was Theo wanted control. He deserved it. But Larry kept interfering. So he was like, fuck this. I'm out. And that's when John Henry... Like some of these younger fans that are like, oh, fuck John Henry. Like he doesn't open up his pockets. John Henry was the one that went and got Theo back. He was like, please. He's like, don't <laughs> leave. Come back. Let's figure this out. Again, go read Feeding the Monster. Great book. Talks about all this shit and talks about how like the Mike Hazens of the world used to be here. And, uh, you know, you had uh, this super team of general managers that that used to exist here. Uh, under Theo Epstein, Jed Hoyers and Ben Charrington's like it was an all star roster of of baseball minds. Um, but yeah, that's that's kind of what this organization has been missing a little bit is that touch of Larry. But yeah, Theo to all go back to what I was trying to say in the beginning, uh, Theo knows that he has a shelf life. So I don't think that he's looking at it like. I'm going to take this job again. I'm going to try and build the Red Sox back up, win a World Series, another one, a third one in Boston. Uh, and, and I'm in this for the long haul. He's probably looking at it the way that he looked at it before. 
Everybody's got a shelf life. I'll come back. I'll build up this group or I'll continue to build the group that's already been building. Uh, and then we'll put a championship roster on the field. Maybe, you know, because the Cubs, they only got one ring, but they were in the playoffs pretty much for, for that whole run there. Like they were at least going to the NLCS or they were they were at least considered to be uh, one of the teams that were contending for a World Series title. Um, Theo could come back for one more run. And then when it's over, I mean, that's what he did. That's Here. what he did in 2011. He's like, all right, uh, I, I gave you your run from 03 to 2011. We got two rings. We were very good for the entire run. But now it's clearly falling apart at the seams. And this is going to be someone else's problem. Like we got left high and dry. Like he wasn't. He was like I, the shelf life thing is the run is done. Now it's someone else's turn to like take the the pieces and build that back up for the, for the next run, which Ben Charrington did and won a World Series two years later. Even in Chicago, right? We saw when he handed the keys over, it was like, all right, Jed Hoyer, like take this thing and fucking fly, baby. And, you know, see where it can kind of bring you. You know, you sat below me and you know, when we came here and all these different things you learned. But I felt like the shelf life hit again. The only thing that scares me with this stuff is it reminds me a little bit of where we were in 2019, where I know you remember it, Jared. There was a couple of weeks where people started pushing the Theo thing where like that was a thing like could Theo come back? Like, could that possibly happen? Is there a maybe a dinner or something going on where somehow this all comes together? I remember, bro, you really want to dig into receipts. I used to have a show called Pombo and Milliken on the Curry College radio station that I used to do with my uh, boy, Jason Pombo. And I remember having this conversation about Theo and I let myself get a little excited back then talking about it. And I was like, man, can you imagine? And we did a whole hour just dreaming, just dreaming about what it'd be like possibly to get Theo Epstein back. I just wonder if this is part of the, the process now, whenever the job becomes potentially open or even a conversation, is that just something people go to because they can't accept or get over that era of Red Sox baseball? And the dream is always like, man, imagine, imagine if we could do it just one more time. Like, imagine if it could happen. It's almost too perfect. Yeah. Um, so it's, I don't know. It's like, not even like that. you said. It's one percent. Like you, you didn't want. You're not saying this is like fucking. Oh, talk about it. Like this needs no. to be 10 a.m. You know, Zolak and Bertrand on no. Tuesday or whatever. No. But just the idea of it, it does remind me a little bit of that, where it feels like that's where people's mind wants to go every time. Yeah, but like you also like think about it this way, and you're hearing this. Like you're only telling us what you're hearing. Yeah, but I'm also being honest that it's. Small, 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 small percentage. It's just not zero percent. Um, but with Theo, <laughs> it's like he's an excellent baseball executive. But when Theo leaves in 2011, you can't replace Theo with Theo. So that wasn't an option during that vacancy. And then after Dombrowski or Ben Charrington, it's like, all right, well, then like Theo wasn't going to be an option that soon after Charrington. Um, it's really the first opportunity that it's come up where it just seems feasible, right? Like he wasn't going to be the guy after Dombrowski. Um, and, and the thing about Theo is for all the, the, the love that Andrew Friedman gets, that's basically Theo's MO as well. Like you're going to build a, a, a a farm system that is a conveyor belt of talent that comes into your major league roster, but you can also make the big trade and you can pull off the big free agent signing. That's what happened under Theo Epstein. These are all oh. the, these, all these guys are his kids. Like say whatever you want to do, bro. Theo could walk up to you and be like, you're my fucking son. Sit down. The way you view the game, the way you approach it, the way you hope to build an organization. I made the blueprint for you. There's a reason why when Theo came here and all this stuff, it was so revolutionary. And we look back at the way he did it because he was the fucking first one to do a lot of these things, especially being as young as he was in the game and all that. They've all tried to remake it and do different parts of it. That's why, like, listen to a Hein Bloom interview when he talks about what he grew up on and all that different shit. It all leads back to the same road. It's always Theo. And I just pulled it up. I was kind of Googling while you were talking. September 25th, 2019. Cubs Theo Epstein says he's not eyeing return to the Red Sox. Uh, here we go. He just said there's nothing to the story. I have a lot of great relationships with the people who work for the Red Sox, and I wish them the very best, but there is nothing more to it. So, like, that's where that conversation was at that time. His future was very, you know, at that time in a much different place. 
where he was with Chicago and all that stuff. So I'm not going to act like they're parallel or anything like that. But it is interesting to hear this come back to the top again now that, you know, potentially from what people are hearing, maybe Bloom isn't as safe as everybody thought he was. Yeah. Uh, And the thing about Theo, too, is it's very rare to see a general manager who visibly has a great relationship with his manager and also the players because it's your job to be the bad guy. You're the guy that's trading guys. You're the guy that's uh, designated players for assignment, releasing guys, telling guys you're not good enough to be on this roster. Smell you later. Like you have to be the bad guy a lot more than you get to be the good guy. So it speaks volumes. It obviously helps when you win, uh, which he that's all he's really done in his career. Um, but it speaks volumes to the the man that he is, that he's able to maintain and build these relationships with like in, in dynamics where you don't normally see such positivity. Like you don't normally see a general manager have such great relationships with his players or the manager of the team. There's always butting heads somewhere. There's always fuck that guy, like whatever. Not with Theo. And that's the parallel to Hein Bloom and what some of the biggest questions with him are that what's the relationship with AC? The clubhouse doesn't seem yeah. to always feel good. That That's the linkage you can kind of make there and say, well, this was a guy who succeeded in that department. It's fair to question whether that's one of Heim's biggest weaknesses or if it's just something he's never going to figure out. So I can't speak to that. I, <laughs> I don't talk to either one of them about each other. Like I don't go there. So I don't even have a gauge on it. But from talking to other people, it it seems like it's ping ponging around. Like one second you think the relationship is good. They're on the same page. The next second it's like, oh, they're not on the same page. I, it's almost like you need to. There needs to be a website that you refresh every single day. Like, are they on the same page dot com? And it, it, the results would probably change every single day. Like, I don't know. I, You're I giving me like Ronnie and Sam vibes from. Jersey yeah, Shore. yeah. Like I can't speak to their relationship. I don't know if it's rock solid. I don't know if they have a good working relationship. I don't know uh, what the respect level is there. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. But I do know that it appears to be up and from talking to other people, like it appears to like one day it's good. One day it's not one day. It's good. One day it's not. Let me frame it in this way. Do you think. Heim Bloom and Alice Cora, and this is the conversation we had on the baseball hour on Friday. Do you think they work together? Like their outlooks on ball? Because the way I kind of framed it was, I think Bloom can maybe be too analytical at times, maybe lacking a bit of a feel for the old schoolness, some of the clubhouse stuff, some of just what it means, the intangibles on field, where, you know, David Ortiz was talking about this recently in an interview he did for the Globe where there's certain things just like numbers aren't going to reveal to you. It's somewhere in the middle between analytics and, you know, just baseball being baseball. Do you think that Cora almost can feed some of maybe the weaknesses or things that Heim Bloom doesn't have? Or is it they need to be exactly aligned on their way of thinking? Like, can they even themselves out? Because Cora has a little bit more of that old school, but with an understanding of analytics. Um, so I think I, the thing about Heim is I think that he values Alex's opinion and his gauge, like the the feel thing. Like the fact that Alex Cora is allowed to manage this team with feel versus being handed a sheet that said the computer said this, so that's how you manage the game. I think Haim respects Alex's feel for the game so that it's a two-way street. Like you're allowed to manage with feel, but Alex's feel for his own players is then sent back up the other way to Heim, where I feel like that input is valued. Does that make sense? So, yeah, you're telling me you think Heim does take what he says into account. Like it's part yes. of the conversation. Now, yes. how much but I don't is know, probably the I don't know back that, and forth. that Cora is as receptive to upstairs telling him how to do his job. That's a very fascinating way to put it. Yeah. So it's like, you know, the front office or Heim is like, I value your input, Alex, on uh, your players. I value your input on 
players throughout the league. Like if like because I I think we can all sit here and say that Alex probably had some input on Kenley Jansen and Chris Martin being on this team. Like that was like hey easily like we need veteran guys in the back end of the bullpen and that is message received and here you go. So I, I, it's I think that it's being received that way. But for example, like let's say the front office uh, wants, like now that the Red Sox are out of it, maybe it's like, all right, well, we want this guy in the lineup. Like we want to see this guy. So but, Don Raffaella, Will you Abreu, who have right. not, I, I have the numbers in front of me. Yeah, That's it's a like, conversation we need to have today as well. Yeah, something like that. Like I, I, maybe it's not like uh, now you're in the, those, I don't want to say muddied waters, but you're definitely in a territory where it's not like if the Red Sox were in it, I feel pretty confident in saying that that the front office is like Alex Cora. This is your team. Manage the like we built the roster. We you helped build the roster a little bit, but we're trying to win a World Series. We're trying to get in the playoffs. Like you manage this team how you see fit. It's your lineup card, etc. But now you are in the uh, let's see what we got for next year phase. And there might be some differing of opinions on who wants to be seen and how often they're going to be seen, what pitchers they're going to be seen against, how often, things like that. And that's where you go back to a little bit of last year at the trade deadline when you have guys like Bogart speaking out or those Alex Kors words just through the voice of his players, the guys who can say those kind of things and what it may be uh, when they're like, oh, well, we don't understand what the fuck's going on here. The front office has their plan. They knew what how they wanted to go about this thing. We don't get it or we're not very understanding. And we talk about it like I think that's one of the weirdest things going on with the Red Sox right now. And, you know, we talk about Sedan Raffaella, a guy who has things he clearly still needs to work on, including chase rate in these things. He started one game since he came up one game and he's appeared in six. Like he appeared in all three of these Royals games. He got two plate appearances on Friday, one on Saturday, zero on Sunday. He's three for eight at the plate. I don't care what you tell me or whatever way you frame it. That doesn't make any sense. He, there's no reason for him to be sitting on the bench. Either he should be down in AAA playing every day and continuing to grow because you were saying it, you know, Brian Abraham was saying it in the Globe a week ago. We still think he has stuff he needs to work on, you know, clearly. Did I tell uh, you to that, get a, that Brian Abraham loves you? I did. That <laughs> still is the best compliment I've ever yeah. got in my entire life. Yeah. Um, shout out Brian Abraham. He's, but he's, like that's, uh, he's a Millican militia guy. Fuck yeah. Thank you, Brian, <laughs> if you're listening. Um, but like that's what was being said in the Globe. Well, now you have this guy sitting on your bench. And it's awesome that he goes and plays the outfield for a couple innings at the end of the game. That doesn't do shit for anybody. You have Will Your Abreu. He didn't start any of the three games. Paired on Friday and Sunday, you know, was in today for like half an inning fielding before they pinched him with Rob Snyder. That doesn't like those are guys where you have this little bit of like they're playing Verdugo and Duvall every day and Yoshida's playing. How do you make this all work here? Now you're five and a half games back. It feels like mixed messaging, in my opinion, where they're just in between. They don't really know what to do. And if that's the fucking case, I can understand. Will you or Abreu being up here and you picking your spots Two outfielders and say what you will. I know uh, Sadan Raffaella can spot here, shortstop here and there. At the same time, like Trevor Story is playing almost every single day. Justifying Raffaella once a week at shortstop still isn't enough, in my opinion. It just doesn't pass a sniff test. That's weird. Like if Raphael a three days a week would be a problem to me. Like if you're telling me he gets one shortstop start a week and he makes two starts in the outfield, I'd be like, no, he needs to play every fucking day. Will you a a little differently? If it's like a couple starts a week, whatever, that's fine. I can understand that. Raphaela too high of a commodity and you're hurting his stock. If he's just sitting on the bench like that. The best Thursday of the year is coming up, and it's all about NFL opening night. Football is back, and DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NFL, is hooking up new customers with can't-miss offers to celebrate. Place your first $5 NFL bet and score $200 in bonus bets instantly. DraftKings is hooking everyone up with the game day greatness. All customers can take advantage of two new offers every single game. This September, uh, check the app to see what you get. Don't wait. 
till kickoff to get in on the hype. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app right now. Use the promo code Jared, J-A-R-E-D. New customers get $200 in bonus bets instantly when you bet just $5. That's promo code Jared, only on the DraftKings Sportsbook. The crown is yours. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. In New York, call 877-8-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY to 467-369. In West Virginia, visit www.1800gambler.net. In partnership with Hollywood Casino at Charlestown Races. All games regulated by the West Virginia Lottery. Please play responsibly. In Connecticut, help is available for problem gambling. Call 888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org. On behalf of Boot Hill Casino and Resort. 21 plus in most eligible states, but age varies by jurisdiction. See DraftKings.com slash sportsbook for details and state-specific responsible gambling resources. Bonus bets expire seven days after issuance. Eligibility and deposit restrictions apply. Terms at sportsbook.draftkings.com slash football terms. Um, I'm not doing any more Red Sox parlays. I, I fucking crush the baseball parlays until <laughs> I, I until they're the Red Sox. Like it, the... um. I had a, what was it? Casas, two plus total bases. Adam Duvall, two plus total bases. Red Sox minus one and a half uh, against, who is it? Fucking, who started the first game of that series? Uh, I don't know. Some shit. I don't, I, I don't remember. Was it Brady Stinger? Uh, oh, oh no. You talk about, the, oh, I thought you were talking about James Paxson. It was Jordan Lyles. Jordan Lyles. Yeah. Fucking sucks. Almost threw a perfect game against the Red Sox. Again. Like, I did that twice this year against them. The numbers, the numbers were actually insane. Like Duvall, Duvall and Casas were like the, it, both in like the top 10 in baseball in the last two months in slugging percentage against righties. And they were facing one of the worst right handed pitchers in baseball history. Dude almost threw a fucking perfect game. And then like the next night, the same parlay would have hit. Red Sox win by fucking 20. Casas hits a home run. Duvall's got 30 fucking total bases. I'm like, no, no, just stop. Like th- this team has already hurt me so much this year. Now you're going to, now you're going to cost me money on top of it. No, absolutely. They're pushing you to the edge. Yeah. No fucking chance, dude. Um, well, we've done an hour and 50 on <laughs> GM, Theo talk, David Sturds, <laughs> the subreddit, and we've yet to do anything on the games. Fuck the games. This, should we just Fuck speed them. run them? No. No, you don't want to, you're not going to say what was the best thing that happened to you out of the series play when it ended. Okay. All right. <laughs> Fair take. Yeah. I will say my favorite moment of the series, Chris sale, Alex Cora, what happened in the fifth inning today where yeah, sale, cool. the line was kind of blah. If you weren't watching super close, he was grinding. The, vo- the velocity was fucking weird, man. Slider down 3.1 miles per hour on his yearly average four seamer 2.1. Change up 2.4. He hit 88 at one point, And I was like, what the? F- is he about to get pulled? Like, is that what we're going to see here? But he would just pull it out of his back pocket when he needed it. That's, I guess, a veteran being a veteran. But core going out there, clearly just, you know, considering pulling him, but not all the way there. Sale being like, I'm fucking staying in. One second of talking. Ends up throwing his hardest pitch of the night. It was like 96.8. And he gets out of the inning. Nice moment for Chris Sale. And what has not been a really good stretch for him or really any Red Sox pitcher. So felt nice for something uh, good to happen for once um, over the last week or so. Six shot. No, five shot, five shot, five strikeouts. Um, yeah. What was it? His fastest two pitches were after Cora came out and he was like, I'm staying in the fucking game. And then he threw yeah. the hardest two fastballs of the game right after that. It, it was crazy. Like he just went from like low, low, low. And Cora said after the game, he's like, I guess, you know, some days you feel good, some some days you don't. It just felt like a moment where, like, holy shit, the Red Sox got a good outing out of a starter. It's been so fucking long <laughs> since we could say that. Uh, so you could just breathe for a day. Just exhale and enjoy it because now you got the race coming in. Who knows how that could play out for you? <laughs> well, if you listen to the pregame, all they got to do, <laughs> all they got to do is win 17 yeah. out of the next 19, and then maybe they have a chance. You ever seen Moneyball, kid? Yep. You just never know. That's why we watch. That is why we watch. You just never know. What is their uh, after this huge series win over the Royals? Their playoff odds sit at. Fangrass refused to load the page for me. Before Five point eight percent. Feels right. I mean, that's better odds than Theo Epstein coming here. So now you're just making people sad again. 
Negative well, Jared. No, it's it's not zero. It's not zero. One percent. Somewhere in there. Yeah. Two percent. Somewhere in there. Give me a three. No, I can't do that. Three <laughs> percent is like, like, what if I yeah, told you cooking. you had a three percent chance of winning the mega millions and it was like a seven hundred and fifty million dollar jackpot? Like, you'd probably feel pretty jacked up about <laughs> your chances. If I said you had I'd a three percent chance businesses. to win. I'd be making the calls, <laughs> the boat money, everything. We'd be getting really fucking. You wouldn't need point. boat crash money anymore. Well, no, but I would be trying to elevate my entire business at that point. I'd be you trying to get boat crash money out of everybody. Million, like you would obviously, t- <laughs> you you would take the one lump sum. Like you wouldn't do the payments. Oh no! Come on, I'm not financially smart. Yeah. Well, no, the one lump sum is actually the better option. That's smarter. Mm-hmm. Like all the financial ex, all the financial experts tell you to take the lump sum if you win the lottery. You know what I hate? What? When jobs do that pool where everyone does it. Yeah. If I won the fucking lottery, I don't want to be counting that shit up and splitting it with everyone. Like doing that dumb shit. If I won the lottery, no one would ever hear from me again. Well, it'd be the last day Tyler Milliken existed on the face of the earth. Back in the day, me and Trent. Like on our lunch break every day, we would go around the corner from uh, the old Barstool office, Barstool HQ2, and we would buy lottery tickets. And he, w- I would have my numbers that I would play. He would have his numbers that he would play. And if if he won, I would get half. And if I won, he would get half. That's and- fair. That's you and your boy. I can respect that. Yeah. Like we had we had a lottery thing going for a long time, probably like two years. <laughs> like we would go every fucking day and get our numbers. And yeah, we had a lottery packed. Like imagine winning and be like, oh, yeah, I got to give fucking 20 million to Barbara down the hall. Fucking Barbara. You think I want to give 20 million to fucking Barbara? If I, if I hit the lottery for fucking 400 million dollars i would be pumped to give trent ryan 200 million dollars me and jake are getting a good amount at that point like absolutely like i know it's easier to say that now when you don't have it but like there are definitely people that i would break off no doubt you have that's the best part where you could be like dog i am about to change your life forever yeah, because like like, you know, I already as good have as getting the money. Like I already have the house that I want to live. In. Like I don't know. I'd probably just build a moat. Like I, I don't think. Like I would have to moat. build a moat. I would have I to. Like that. Yeah. I, I would build the moat for you. Yeah, I, I'll give you a million dollars to build me a moat. A million? Really? You don't have to be to build a moat, dude. You got to do how hard a moat. I could picture how much how, water I have to get. How, Tyler, how much? How much do you think a fucking moat costs? Do you think it's a million dollars? Around your house, or are we talking another house? My house. I don't. Even, if like, right. let's just say, let's just say I That's have permission from the town that I could. All right, I have permission from the town to build a moat. You think they're gonna be like, like someone's gonna come over, look at the land, and be like, bought a million? <laughs> yeah, actually, uh, I, no. don't, I don't know how much things. Come. No, I'm not a real adult. I, no, I've never dude, purchased things that much. That at most, at how most, how much is a pool? That is a hundred thousand dollar job. At most, much, and that's generous. Like, how at, much does a pool cost? Like a hundred thousand. No, 100,000 for a pool to build me a moat at my house with permission from the town. Probably it could be like 50 grand. Huh? Just, right, you're digging I, a fucking I'm sorry. hole. I, I'm not. Once you get to a certain level of money, I really don't know what things are worth. That rough, like, rough estimate between 50 to $75,000. And I was going to give you a million. You're like, that's it. That's it. Dude, what 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 job do you have the fucking skills to possess that you could get paid a fucking million dollars to do it? You just got to dig a hole around my house. Well, I'm going to have to, you know, get employees and other people who are going to help. Oh, now now you need a whole team to do it. Well, you want me to build the moat by myself? It's, it's a take million dollars, Tyler. I have one shovel. I have one shovel. Did Jared. I say did I say that it was time sensitive? You could be out there all fucking year. I don't give a fuck. Just build me a moat. I'm basically like a, a. I'm working for you at that point. Yes, I, I'm. I'm one of your, your little minions. It's it's called an employee. You're getting paid a million dollars to dig a hole. Go get a bucket and get the fuck out there. <laughs> I do. I am great at a beach. If you give me like the what do you call it the uh, the uh, 
the bucket the string basket the what what, what is it the the you it's know, a pail. bucket i don't know what it's called <laughs> whatever the the <laughs> cylinder the whatever you want to call it bro uh, are you talking about a bucket like it's a bucket it's, there's a word for the beach one like it's not just a bucket like, jake, the, um, jake jake a bucket's jake, just something you jake, piss in jake are we talking about a bucket I think he's describing a bucket. <laughs> he's like, yeah. he's like, you know, the cylinder with the string thing that you hold it with. It's a bucket, dude. <laughs> let me let me see. Beach digging instrument. <laughs> let me let me see what I can come up with here. Oh um, my god. It's a bucket. Yeah, I'm seeing some people use that term. Maybe it is a bucket. <laughs> whatever fuck you yeah, some people uh, this this little plastic <laughs> cylinder that has a white string so you can hold it up some people are referring to it as a bucket i don't know exactly what the word is i've heard it Listen, referred to as a bucket in some beach circles not I'm me new to personally this business. not me personally not a big bucket guy but you know if you call it that i'm gonna kind of know what you're talking about yeah I'm going to turn it into a lazy river because I'm a huge lazy river guy. You get me in a water park. You want to see me cook? When I was like 12 years old, I mm-hmm. fell asleep in the lazy river one time. Oh, no way. You know how embarrassing that is? Why, and I Why woke is that embarrassing? Up. It's a lazy river. No, but I was so sunburned that some nice, you know, older gentleman firmly grasped my arm while I was floating and sleeping. He goes, young man, I think you need to get out of the sun for a while. Family didn't care. Family was going to let me fucking die. Old man over here firmly grasped me and, uh, you know, he got me back on track, made sure I was OK. Very bad burns. Blisters. Actually, speaking of 2012, that was the worst burn that I went to. Was it Block Island? And I burned my foot so bad that it was like it looked like it was harnessing the power of the sun. That's awful. Yeah. Have you ever had Hell's Itch? What's that? Okay, like you're gonna, make you're gonna look up. at me a little weird here. Yeah, talking probably. About this. Yeah. I had a condition roughly six years ago. My first year at uh, the condo we've been staying at for a while now. Um, I went out to the beach. Yeah, thank you. It it was bad. Uh, it was scary. Um, <laughs> but we were down there for roughly five days. This happened on the second day. I got the sunburn. I came home, went to bed. I woke up at night on fire. My skin burning. I'm twitching, convulsing, screaming, mom, please help me, mom, please. My skin is burning, crying. I'm not an emotional guy usually, uh, banging on the walls. And keep in mind, we have neighbors. I'm like, mom, please, please, mom, please get the what's that fluid from the plant that you you put on sunburns? Aloe. Whatever you. Yeah, aloe. Put it on. It didn't stop. It would just happen every hour or two where my skin would start burning. Look up Hell's Itch right now. It's a real thing. It's only it's not a real medical condition, but it's on Reddit. People know what I know. Oh, it's, it's on Reddit. <laughs> I yeah. read a whole it's a big, set of it's this. A big Reddit credibility episode. We are really putting the power of Reddit on full display today. All right. This is different. This is medical. Here it is. Hell's Itch is this deep, painful, almost throbbing itch that happens one to three days after a sunburn, often on the upper back and shoulders. I was legit smashing my body back and forth as hard as I could against the bed stand in the middle of the night, praying for relief. So if you have Hell's Itch or you ever been through something, please reach out to me. There's people who understand who get it. Um, It was dark. It was bad. But thank you for hearing me out. Thank you. It was the worst pain in my life. One of them. Thank you for sharing. I feel better. Also, since we're here. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <clears throat> it's been a while. I'm rusty. Yeah. It's been a long time. Need a Tristan Casas shrine. Doogie, cycle shy. The ketchup is back. Duval and Massa, big wax. Sail pitch, didn't yak. A series of haikus by Tyler Milliken. Did you say he didn't yak? I didn't yak. You didn't yak. Sail pitched. How did I frame it? How did I hold on? Sail pitched, didn't yak. So 
you're saying that you normally throw up when he pitches? Lately. A little bit. It's been ugly. You know he'll kill you, right? <laughs> oh, he'll beat the fuck out of me. Chris Sale, I love you. I've always supported you. But, mm-hmm. You know, facts are facts here. Mm-hmm. I did bring back the butterflies today as well. The skulls felt wrong and depressing. Yeah, I went to um, I went to full lowercase gold bottles tweets. I hate it. I even thought about retiring gold bottles altogether. Don't stop it. It's a round number. It, this is the tenth season of the gold bottles tweet, and but you can't cancel it on a year like this. Twenty twenty. It was years born. It was, it was born on a year like this. That, that's what I'm saying. But this isn't. This is an 86, 85, 86 wins. It could be so much worse. I think it's more just like, I don't know. I, I don't know. It's been 10 years. It's been 10 years of gold bottles tweets. Now, what like, are you going to do if you don't gold bottle? I don't know. I just feel like I, I, I'm, I'm so, people copy me so much on Twitter now or X. Like now everyone's got like a post game celebratory tweet. Like the tweet and highlights. Now everyone does that. It's like it's, I miss the Vine days, Jared. Yeah, yeah. It's like now, I, like I, I gotta find like a new way. Like I like started a bunch of things, and then everyone copied me, and now I gotta find my new thing that everyone's gonna copy me for that for. Yeah, not to down your semen here or anything like that, but like we talked about earlier with everyone looking at Theo. As like, you know, hi, I'm Andrew Friedman, all these guys. At the end of the day, people like me, all the other people in the community, you're our Theo. Say what you will. Oh, you're wow. the social media Theo. Oh, wow. That is. Uh... We, we, that's where we all got it from. You can frame I mean, it. You need to be wrong. original. That's wrong. where people pop for a certain reason or whatever. You're doing something on your own. That's special. But who gave us the blueprint? It's true. For the kids. For the kids, <clears throat> yeah, we. I, feel, I just feel like, uh, I just feel like I got to do something new, and I know what that is too. By the way, like I know I'm not doing it yet, but I think next year, uh, I may have to hire someone to help me with it. But I already know what I want to do. Is it? Like, it's so. Put it this way, right? When I. I've people have been copying me for fucking a decade and a half. When I started Sock Space, it was a MySpace page that I was the first person to take a MySpace page and make it something and make it a sports fan page. It wasn't like a profile. You add your buddy on there. Back then, people had MySpace and it was who they were. It was they didn't always use their real name, but it was always like a, a person. I was the first person to make a Red Sox page or like a sports team themed page. Started doing that, got popular. Everyone started copying me. Everyone made Red Sox pages. Everyone made their own sports team pages. Uh, So then I was like, okay, how do I make it different than all the people that are now copying me? And that's when I started blogging. It's like, okay, like you can be a Red Sox fan page too, but you can't have my blogs. Like that's something that only this page can have. So it's kind of on the in, on the same note of, <clears throat> uh, all right, everyone else can start doing the same shit that I do. Um, but there are things that I can do that only I can do. Like right now, like anyone, anyone can like tweet highlights and do like funny captions. And um, I mean, it's the same thing with like the podcast, which I think is good. Like I, I I have like a good relationship with a lot of the other Red Sox podcasts out there, but um, how do you make that different? How do you make your Twitter different now that everyone is kind of doing what you were doing first? Well, I think I have the answer to that. And maybe I'll do it next year. <clears throat> hmm. Yeah. Not giving us any details. Um, is it video based? Yeah. 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 I won't ask for any more. I don't want to. Well, I mean, it's it's to... not like a it's not like a super big like unveiling surprise thing. I think it's just more the answer is like more uh, video content for social media because uh, you know, like I think I think 
the one thing that leaving Barstool, like I've noticed, is like I still tweet a ton, but I'm not in as much video content. Uh, so it's like you've got to now, like instead, like when they would follow you around the office and like take videos of you and then they like you could share videos that someone else took and then you put them on your page. So people like your tweets, like if they're funny, but they're not seeing you as much anymore. So now, because I don't have someone filming me, like now I've got to, like, how do I kind of like make, like, in addition to tweeting, like the words, uh, there's got to be a video component to it too. You're kind of, you know, you were part of a world at one point. You kind of are the world in a lot of ways at DraftKings because you're doing this, you know, you're taking the venture when you went there and did these different things. You know, you're you don't have all these people in terms of personalities, like all horse and content trying to make stuff every single day. Like you said, following you around and just pushing whatever it is, because that was the barstool space. Yeah. Like if you were in the barstool office, you had a camera in your face. Ten times out of ten. And like, I didn't always love that because they'll also capture your weak moments and your low points. And that's not always a good thing. But now there's no cameras in my face. So well, unless I'm doing the podcast or I'm doing a show at the DraftKings office, so I can I, follow you. And I also just don't, you could do that. You can move in. with I'd me. be good at it. You'd be great at it. I well, that's the thing is I would want you in it. But. I think we should put a GoPro on Jake's forehead. We could do that, too. See, see like, I don't. I don't like doing selfie videos and I don't like take selfie pictures. I don't like filming myself like it makes me uncomfortable. But when you were in the office, you always had someone that was filming you and then you can take that video and you can post it. And it's like, that's great. So I have to find a way to get over that and like film shit that I can put out there because it's just I feel like that's a that's a pitch in my repertoire that is a good pitch that I haven't thrown very much in the last couple of years. I can't imagine wa- imagining you walking through DraftKings with the camera on you either. You're going to have to go about it like in a, in a unique way. And again, like it's all about like for something like that, like being filmed in the office, it's like you, you need like organic moments to happen. Like it can't be scripted. Like none of the stuff in the office was ever scripted it was just like just chaos these guys are screaming at each other let's film it and it was magic like a lot of we the people need- in the DraftKings office like they're football people i mean steve buchanan loves baseball but like he's he's a mariners fan but it, like it's all like red like what are we going to argue about they're all boston people they're all red sox people like there's not you're not going to get that like red sox yankees like going at each other's throats type deal but i think more of what I'm thinking is is not like totally like produce content, but more it's just more video stuff. Like I feel like we're <laughs> we're missing that. We need your Frank the Tank moments. Yeah, more more like I, I want to watch you walk into the office <laughs> and just be like, "Fuck!" Like nothing <laughs> in my life. Like someone sets you off. I don't know who it is. Someone plays that role, and then we just watch you start screaming at everybody who's sitting around you or whatever it may be in your own way. And it's not even necessarily like office content. Like it's just more like maybe the streets of Boston. It's it's video blogs, which I guess like when you say a video blog, it's like, oh, so a A vlog, a vlog is like, oh, like, you know, get ready with me. Like, oh, this is my whole day. It like a vlog to me. Logan, you took. 12 hours or 48 hours and then you chopped it up into two minutes like that to me is a vlog it's more just like reactionary like if something happens in the baseball world i would write a blog about it there should just be like a video about it now like that's that's what i need to be doing more of i like that and i miss the live stream stuff from last year as well people have said that but it's like it's just too fucking much like it was too much on you. Yeah. Like it, it's, well, you have more stuff this year than you did a year ago as well. Way more plays part of it. Yeah, it's way more. I mean, like for a while, it was just like we didn't have things set up. And like, I still don't like I still I got left high and dry on like a lot of that. The the technical stuff the the dude that was like doing work in my house and then fucked me. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was like Tuesday. Tuesday was supposed to be kind of like my break in the week 
where I was going to do more video content. And then I ended up like that. Now that's my office day. And if the Red Sox are home, then I go from the office to Fenway to do interviews for baseball is dead or like the Tuesday, like sweat that we do in the office. So it, it became like a free day to like a full day's work. So I couldn't commit to, there wasn't like no, no day that would have made sense. Like I wasn't going to do it on a Friday night. Um, cause like, that's like another day that I'm usually at Fenway if the Red Sox are home. So yeah, but I'd like to still like get stuff like that back in the mix. It's just tough because I think it's, it's boring when it's just me, but you're an hour away. Jake. Listen, if you want to film some fucking vlog content, and I think what people would like, the Nesson stuff's very cool, and I think a lot of people enjoy it, but it's very structured, right? Like, it's very structured, it's professional, it's well shot, more of a rough, yeah. like, uh, we're just fucking guys out, we're doing dumb shit. Jared teaching me about the world, mm. teaching me what moats cost, and explaining these <laughs> things. Maybe bring me, me to a moat shop. What moats cost. Jared yeah. and Tyler go to the beach. You teach me about a fucking uh, bucket thing, right? Like all these different stuff. A bucket these, thing. These are, it's just a bucket. We'd have a great beach day. It's just a bucket. Who doesn't want to watch us build sandcastles? I think I think a Tyler workout series would also be great, too. Bang, yeah. dude. It bang. You want to yeah. see me turn into a fucking athlete, dog? Wait for it. I can. Uh, how tall are you? 5'10". In three quarters. You are? Yeah, dude. Dude. I, I think uh, I'm, I'm taller than you. You're not. You're just so five eleven. Yes. So knock it down an inch. If right? Kike so is five eleven, actually... I'm five eleven. Like looking at the picture of me and Kike standing, he's listed at five eleven. So he's probably five ten. Then all right, then I'm five ten. But he's five eleven, and I'm like a little bit taller than him. All I remember is last time I was standing next to you, I was like, I might have a little bit on him. Jake's taller than both of us, though, right? Well, he always wears work boots. He's probably like 5'10", 5, 5'11", 5, too. How tall are you, Jake? I'm like 5'10", yeah. yeah. Oh, great. So we're all the same height. Yeah. Medium height kings. Yeah. Average. We're average. That's all we should ever strive to be. Don't have to be great. Don't strive for great. Boston Red Sox. Strive for average. <laughs> we just want to be in the mix. If you're going to strive for greatness, that's called being Blue Moon. Because Blue Moon is the greatest beer that you could ever hope to drink. Um, and I know, Jake, Jake, you probably had some Blue Moons over the weekend, right? I sure did, Jared. A whole bunch of them. Because that was the only way I was getting to sleep on Friday night after Paxton shit his pants on the mound. But playoffs are just around the corner. So it's time to help your team out by sticking to your lucky rituals. Like the ritual of enjoying an ice cold Blue Moon while the game is on. Blue Moon was born in a ballpark. First brewed at Coors Field in Denver, Colorado. Make it your one-of-a-kind baseball tradition whether you're at the park or watching from home. I watched from home this weekend, and like I was saying earlier, I had plenty of blue moons to keep me company. Speaking of blue moons, it occurred to me that the only time that Tyler and I have ever agreed about anything on this podcast happened the same night as the rare super blue moon on Wednesday. According to NASA, who I assume is a pretty trustworthy source on the moon, the next time a blue super moon is set to arrive is in 2037. So, if we're following that same pattern of Tyler and I only agreeing on nights where there's blue supermoons, you're going to have to wait another 14 years for that to happen again, and that honestly feels about right. With its refreshing flavor with Valencia orange peel for a subtle sweetness and hints of coriander, Blue Moon Belgian-style wheat ale is a one-of-a-kind beer that's made brighter. It's carefully crafted and full-flavored with refreshing notes and a smooth, creamy finish. Blue Moon was brewed by baseball to give you a dose of nostalgia and get you excited for the new season. Why strike out with the same old beer when you can get something one-of-a-kind? It's bold flavor, bright color, and iconic orange slice ritual guarantee a one-of-a-kind beer experience perfect for spring weather. Best served with its signature orange garnish to showcase its beautiful bright color. A beer this good only comes around once in a blue moon, but you can enjoy it all season long. Brighten up your baseball traditions with Blue Moon Belgian-style wheat ale. It's one-of-a-kind every time. Check out shop.bluemoonbrewingcompany.com for baseball merch and visit get.bluemoonbeer.com slash jared to find Blue Moon delivery options. That's get.bluemoonbeer.com slash Jared. Blue Moon, made brighter. Celebrate responsibly, Blue Moon Brewing Company, Golden, Colorado Ale. Thank you, Jake. Appreciate you. Um, for the people that are probably curious, we, we do have ketchup. We gotta do it. Like, I, I was kind of confused 
was like, do we do ketchup? Do we not do ketchup? Like, does it matter? Does it not matter? But like, do the games matter? No. But should should guys that have a big series be have ketchup taken from them because of the team's performance? And ketchup means even extra for the younger guys who are maybe yeah. making a point or proving something like a Tristan Costas down the stretch. Like those things matter a fuck ton here. And there are things to still play for down the stretch here that will mean something for next year and beyond and impact off season moves and all that shit. Look at Adam Duvall. People talk about Adam Duvall now and they're like, I need this guy on my team next year. Who was saying that three weeks ago? No. We love Adam Duvall. We didn't even talk about the Jaron Duran surgery. The I that bothered me the other day as well. What that we didn't talk about it? it? We just were so caught up in other shit, but it just slipped through the news, which way bigger loss than a lot of people want to admit. Um, but yeah, I don't know. We when we first brought it up, we were like, eh. I said I was kind of nervous the next episode because it felt like it went from, oh, this is nothing. We're not having anyone come down to, all right. Well, he's going on the IL. We'll bring up Will you Abreu. You. He's in a fucking walking booth that day. Before we know it, he's out for the season. Yeah. I just, I hope for Jaron Duran, you know, I expect him to be fully healthy for spring training and all that stuff. I know he's been going through stuff off the field. I hope this didn't make it worse. I saw him in Worcester yesterday. Hey, he, looked he looked all smiles. So yeah. I hope that's what it is. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, the where I landed on it was that if you are a player on a bad team, does that make you ineligible for the MVP award? No. It's an individual award. Clark's Ketchup Series MVP. I mean, the team has to win the series for you to be eligible for Clark's Ketchup Series MVP. Nowhere in the rules for Clark's Ketchup does it say that the team has to make the playoffs. So let's drizzle that ketchup. Been a long time. Ketchup Series MVP brought to you by Clark's Ketchup. Drizzle that ketchup. I give to you. Clark's Ketchup Series MVP voting panel for the Boston Red Sox versus the Kansas City Royals series that took place on September 1st through September 3rd. We go to the panel first. Loomer. Loomer Loney. He says... Tristan Casas, first inning home run, woke them up yesterday. I'm going houses. First vote, Tristan Casas. Next up, Dave O'Brien. He says Casas. That's two votes, Casas. Next up, Tom Karen. And he says, Adam Duvall, beast mode. Mm. Okay. Next up. Will Middlebrooks. That's one vote, Rafael Devers. Wow. Fair. Spread out three. Then we have Jemai Webster. And he says... I like the big house. Tristan Casas kept the season on life support last night. Big boy is holding things together. Next up, Kevin Euclid. This is the most spread out vote we've ever had. Masataka Yoshida. 
the vote for Kevin Euclid. Then the final vote here. Alex Cora sends in the house emoji. It is Tristan Casas for the vote. But this vote wouldn't be complete without Will Fleming. <laughs> Live it in, oh, nice. in KC. Fuck you. <laughs> what is up, fellas? My God, it feels like a decade since yeah. we've had a chance to drizzle some ketchup. Mm -hmm. And if I'm being honest, it's kind of hard for me to muster the same energy and fire and passion that we've all shared throughout this entire season. It really is. But you know what? I woke up yesterday morning and learned that Jimmy Buffett had passed away. I know Tyler doesn't know who that is because he's not in high school <laughs> musical. <laughs> But I decided to come to the ballpark today in flip-flops and in a Hawaiian shirt because I decided it's time to celebrate the little things mm -hmm. in life that, by the way, happen to be the important things. And so, you know what? We win a series. We take two of three from the downtrodden Kansas City Royals, and we're going to celebrate that. Yeah. I may not have the same passion, the same fire for this Clark's Ketchup Series MVP that I sometimes do. And also, there wasn't a clear-cut winner in this series. I could have right. gone with Adam Duvall. It's another home run. He's absolutely on a tear. Yoshida set the tone with his three-run bomb. I thought for a while about Alex Cora, who's holding oh. this thing together with chicken wire and string. But yeah. in the end, I got to go with the guy who hit the first inning two-run bomb on Saturday in Kansas City, who's setting the tone throughout this entire run for the Red Sox, who since the... what What is that? What's that sound? Oh, right. <laughs> Tristan motherfucking cut! Yeah! <laughs> Let's go! <laughs> banger. Banger. He did it again. Oh, God. Uh, uh. It's going to end up being Tristan Casas. I'm going Tristan Casas. Uh, Tyler? I'm right there. I'm right there with you. Casas? I do think... I do think there was one name. Maybe Verdugo deserved a little packet thrown his way. Sure. Almost yeah. hit for the cycle. Did hit the only fucking runs in on uh, what? Monday night. What's today? No, today's Sunday. Today's Sunday. On Friday, he hit the two run homer. The only two runs they scored. But yeah, it's Tristan Casas right now. He's the most dangerous hitter in the lineup. That's the way it feels. And if we're being real, Alex Cora told you post game yesterday. He's been one of the best hitters in all of baseball in the second half. You can't deny it. And he's improving defensively. Easy. Jake? Yeah, I got Tristan Casas, too. Mm -hmm. So then, how many, what's the tally? Looks like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven for Casas. I didn't think we would hear the positivity horn ever again this year. I thought we were done with it. If, listen, if you're one of those Red Sox fans that's sitting there being like, wow, you guys are really celebrating. We're not celebrating. No. We're just not miserable fucks like you. We're appreciating. We're, we're appreciating, especially the fact that Tristan Casas won the Clark's Ketchup Series MVP and like how many people were coming at me just for pointing out like that he's having a good year. It's like you're still going to be fucking miserable. Like, don't don't get me wrong. I'm not happy that the Red Sox aren't going to the postseason. Uh, but at the end of the day, the fact that Tristan Casas is like, I don't know. This is like a random name. Let's say Tommy Pham from last year was tearing it up in September. And it's like, we're celebrating that. It's like, well, first of all, he's a journeyman outfielder. He's not going to be here next year. Like that's a little different than Tristan Casas, your first round pick from 2018, having a tremendous offensive season in his rookie season. And being happy about that, totally different. Totally different. It's not a small victory. Oh, you guys are celebrate your small victories. Like, no, no, no. Like, this is a big victory. Casas being good in his rookie season. For a guy that the Red Sox have put all their kind of little coins in a basket for, waiting all their eggs, saying like, this is going to be the guy. Watch what he's going to become. He's not going to be some average ass first baseman. He's not going to be CJ Crone who just hits a bunch of homers and gets flipped to a million friggin' different teams year after year. No, he's going to be up there with the very best in the game. 
since May 1st, 297, 390, 543, 933. May, June, July, August, we're into September. That's four plus months after a horrendous start to the year. There's no denying Tristan Casas anymore. This is his first time seeing a lot of these pitchers. Do we, what do you think he's going to look like a year from now or two years from now as he gets more comfortable? Like, that's the biggest thing to me. I'm seeing improvements on defense. I know a lot of people want to say, oh, he's a DH, yada, yada, yada. Spare me on that. He's going to be just fine defensively. 130 weighted runs created plus in your rookie season. Be scared. Be very scared of Tristan Casas going forward because he's going to torture pitchers. Um, <clears throat> why is this in Spanish? <laughs> oh, perfect. Send it to me. This, you too? This whole the Red Sox website is in Spanish right now. I was like, is it, is it a holiday? No. Oh, mine's in English. Yeah, I was like, it says uh, instead of ERA, it says PCL. And I was like, what the fuck is a PCL? That's how they say ERA in Spanish? I get, I don't know. It's kind of fire. <clears throat> I want, I'm going to ask Cora what that means. I don't know. <laughs> PCL makes me think of AAA. Ah, yeah, I guess. I don't know. Anyways, um, do some look ahead and get the fuck. Do we have do we have fucking lottery too, Jake? It's not sponsored, but we can do it if we want. Why don't we Why don't we do that uh, after the race series? Because we're already two and a half hours into this one. Jesus. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's what happens. That's what happens when people piss me off. We do a royal series. Oh, there's nothing to talk about. Two and a half fucking hours later. Yeah, I thought for sure this was going to be an hour podcast. <laughs> like before you came on, I was like, I don't know what the fuck we're going to talk about. because I don't want to talk about the games. Um, Stop a shop. Look ahead. Just, just touch on it. Brought to you by Stop a shop. There wasn't a stop a shop. Look ahead on the last one. I know that people were freaking out about that. Um, we do apologize to stop a shop. Uh, head on down to stop a shop right now. Use the promo code section 10 to get 10 cents off each tangerine when you buy at least five pounds of tangerines only at stop and shop using the promo code section 10 uh this three game series in tampa bay is uh started off by brian bayo versus aaron savale cutter crawford versus zach i don't want to play for the red sox efflin and tbd in the finale versus tyler the sex god glass now have you heard anything on who wednesday starter would be no i have not i'm going through just to see if the days line up but i'm assuming assuming they're not skipping anyone i don't know that would line up to beat paxton would it not oh yeah i guess we could have probably talked about i mean it's such a long podcast but and we don't need to beat it to death but man was that a huge miss. By the way, did you see the Peter Gammons report? I did. That, that's <clears throat> actually one of the things I did want to talk about. I was told I, before you say a word, I was told that it was bullshit. All right. I'll second this. And yeah. um, I know you can verify this as well. Someone we know on the Jaron Duran side, because he pushed this report as well on the Jaron Duran for Justin Steele. That's what the Red Sox wanted yeah, a year yeah, ago. Yeah, yeah. We've also heard that was not true as well. Yeah. Gammons. I mean, Thank you for your service. God bless <laughs> you for your contributions to baseball journalism. But <clears throat> uh, I, it's it's time, I think. <laughs> like I like that report. Uh, I because I was so curious. Bizarre. Yeah, I was curious, and I I poked around and was told straight up like the term bullshit was the term that I was told about it. Like it wasn't even like oh no that's. I don't know about that. Like, I wouldn't have worded it. Like, no, it was just like, no, that was bullshit. Um, <clears throat> so you're talking Emmett Sheehan, the number 23 prospect in all of baseball, plus two more. Yeah. Yeah. Straight up. Come bullshit. on. And, Come on. and like, it didn't like the, the, the sad part about this, Tyler, is that his report didn't even pick up steam. Like, no one even saw that and was like, what like out of all the people that want to come for Heim Bloom and the Red Sox front office and whatever. Uh, 
you had Peter Gammons report something and it was so absurd that the people that hate Heimbloom were like, ah, come on, Gammo. (laughs) (laughs) You're doing too much. Yeah, go to bed. Yeah. Yeah. So. um, Yeah, that was false. But I think. Like, I, I, I was kind <clears> of, <throat> I was, I was curious. Uh, what, what could you have gotten for James Paxton? Because now we're at the point where you're like, how the fuck didn't they trade this guy? Like, how, how did you not trade this guy? And kind of the general consensus, like poke around with other teams. Because I was really fired up about this if you go back to if you go back to the the trade deadline episode that we did i was very pissed off about this um i've got i've got some little birdies on other teams and i was like what was what was like going on with the paxton stuff and i was kind of told like uh teams we're only offering like uh, nothing in the top 10. Like teams oh were like, my God, yeah, teams, teams were like, um, like we want to see him. Like if, if we're going to bring on a James Paxton, like it's going to be next year. Like we want to see him finish the year strong before we give up like a prospect or cash for James Paxton. So I don't think, any team was offering a prospect in, uh, out of their own personal top 10 for James Paxton. So would you have so, traded him for a team's number 15 prospect? Nope. So that's basically what was happening. Yeah, it, I, I will say that that is surprising because like, you I'm know, surprised think- too, especially after Eddie said no to the Dodgers. I thought for sure that a team would get desperate and pounce at the opportunity to bring in Paxton. But the general consensus from talking to teams that might have been in the mix it was that no team was willing to part with one of their own top 10 prospects for Paxton. Then you throw in the same conversation as well. You had two starting pitchers remaining on the roster, one who has a legit pitch limit and one in Bayo they're already worried about as he stacks innings and they're trying to be careful about. So you would be trading James Paxton for, I don't know, call it a 10 to 15 prospect and who knows whose farm system. You know, Maybe you want to say it's the Dodgers. It's a little bit better than most. Um, in terms of like what you could get out there, right? Or Baltimore. But, yeah, Baltimore maybe falls I into that. I would have traded Paxton within the division without even thinking about it if Baltimore was like, we'll give you our number 12 prospect. Done. Yeah, and they went for Jack Flurry, the a guy who wasn't who was having a rough season as is, and they're like, we're going to try to get this guy back on track. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I think everyone looks at Edgar Caro as what the number 75 overall prospect. The Angels ended up flipping. Well, mm-hmm. it's the fucking Angels. Look at look at their absolute albatross right now that everyone's laughing at. But that points to me even more reason as that, that I'm not going to beat them up for holding on to James Paxton. Obviously, I was on the other side of it than you were at the time. But uh, yeah, if that's what people were looking for, it was definitely not worth it to flip him, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. Just had more value to your team. Just in terms of keeping guys healthy and at least staying afloat. Hearing that, if you- I'm less mad now. That's good. All right. Was like, this after you heard this with your tweet on uh, Friday? Just absolutely obliterating me. Uh, it was the same. <laughs> it was the same day as the Gammons report. Like once I started oh. hearing about like Gam- uh, Paxton trade stuff, it kind of like jogged my brain into like, let me fucking see what the deal was with that. Like, how do they not trade? Because they were, the, I was screaming. I was screaming like a lunatic. Like, why didn't you trade Paxton? Like, that was probably the most angry and fired up I've been on the podcast, like, since we've been doing it together, was why is he still here? And yeah, right up there. That's, that's the answer. It's because you were going to get a team's number 15, 16 prospect for him. That just makes no sense for you at that point. And, yeah. like, you look at it, you know, the four seamer. It was 94.1. The, the it's, season, it's over a mile per hour down. Now. The season died not too long after the trade deadline. But at the time of the trade deadline, you were still alive. So what type of message does that send where trading Paxton is saying like, hey, we're punting. Uh, and not only are we punting, but we got the number 16 prospect in, you know, insert competitive like, team contending organization, it, whatever. And my big thing was when you hold on to Paxton, especially in that case, but I thought even a back top 100 guy, if you were able to get that, maybe 
there is a lot of value you could have got out of Paxton, hoping everything went right at the time and he stayed healthy to keep your team afloat, allow you to compete. But was getting that prospect going to change anything for what you could do that offseason? No, you have the chips to make a major move. You have the money to make a major move. That deal wasn't going to change your outlook moving forward in a major way, one way or the other, unlike the 2022 trade deadline, which had lasting effects because of your comp picks, staying over the tax and getting pushed to the fourth round instead of getting picks after the second round, which hurt when Nate and Xander left, keeping you away from QO guys and different stuff like that because of what you had to give up. And then what it meant for this year, where maybe the picture is a lot different if you were under the luxury tax and you can push more in 2023 and give this team a better shot than they had. <clears throat> yeah, I'm, I'm looking at the text now. This is the exact wording. Yes, the Red Sox definitely could have moved him a couple of places, but for someone's 15th best prospect, that type of deal. Wow. Yeah. Well, that answers that. That's good to know. A lot of little nuggets in this podcast. Yep. Jared, coming in with scoops. Listen, I again, I don't think the Theo thing is a scoop. I think it's a pipe dream, but I just I need to start the narrative. I heard it. That's all you're saying. I need I need Theo to see how excited people would be if he came back. So that that makes him want to come back more. Because right now, I don't I, hate that. It's probably just like, like, oh, that'd be, you know, it's a nice little thought. But, you know, but then if he sees people clamoring for the return, then he's, you know, probably sitting down with the wife being like, babe, you think we should do this? It's kind of crazy. They fucking they really want me back over there. I'll tell you for a long time. Be the change you wish to see in the world, Tyler. Be the change wow, you wish to powerful. see in the world. Yes. Uh, all I'm saying is if Theo Epstein returned to the Red Sox, this would be the Red Sox would be the number one team in this market again. Mm -hmm. It would be the start. The of amount it. of excitement and craziness that would bring mm -hmm. the mid ass Patriots that are just as mid as the Red Sox. <coughs> sweet dreams. <clears throat> yeah, it would really it would move the needle big time. We move the needle big time. The Red Sox need to move that needle. <sighs> what else do we have to do? Picks. We got to pick. Oh. Um, the Red Sox are going to lose two out of three in this series. Ah, uh, you know what? Oh. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mm. Yeah, I'm I'm sticking to one out of three. Yeah, I, I'm trying to talk myself into it, trying to feel confident. Aaron Savali's looked really good since going over to Tampa Bay. I'm worried that Cutter is hitting a bit of a wall here. Zach Eflin, maybe it is a little bit of a fuck you situation. You can go, but knowing James Paxson is most likely starting a game in the series right now, uh, I'm going to have to go one out of three as well. Uh, it's hard to to convince myself one way or the other. Um, in the Rays, they did just take a pretty big hit in their bullpen. If you're looking for a positive, Jason Adam hurt. I think what it was oblique or something like that. So who knows what's going to end up happening with him down the stretch, but that's a shot to their bullpen. Maybe the Red Sox can find a way to sneak one out that way. <clears throat> Jake. Uh, I'm going to go with a sweep for this one for the Sox for the Sox. Okay. <laughs> Nice. So you're feeling good about him right now. Feeling great. Coming off a series win against the back-to-back -back American League champions. I saw Steve loved that joke of mine and decided to use that one. <laughs> <clears throat> Jesus. He does that from time to time. He'll just he'll just use an old section 10 bit that was like mine and be like, guys, right? <laughs> Seven years. You see late. people calling him out underneath the mentions. Are they like, why no. are you doing this? Or did they just kind of laugh? Because it's I don't even I didn't even look. I just saw the tweet and I was like, yeah, that was a joke that I made like four years ago. Steve's not listening right now. 240 in. No, he's in Miami. He's party. I don't know what he's doing in Miami, but he's partying it up right now. In Miami. Well, now he's just copying me. <laughs> you went to Miami. I'm Miami Millican for a reason. Oh, speaking of Steve, I might have an update. Based on when was I there last Sunday after we recorded the last episode. After we recorded the last episode of the podcast, I went to Kowloon with my sister and I saw Andy Wong there. And I said, Andy, uh, I was like, 
was like me, Tyler, Jake. Where the fuck? Oh, we ran out of time, huh? So that's going to happen to me too, right? Any second now. Any second, I'm going to have to refresh. I mean, I, should I just do it now? Just do it. Just yeah, do it. Just do it. Jake, how much are you into High School Musical and you just don't want to admit it in front of Jared? I I mean, I feel like I'm a normal amount of a fan, but nothing like Ooh, Titanic. a fan? That's points. Um, welcome back, Jared. Hello. <clears throat> so I saw Andy and I was like, you know, me, Tyler, Jake, Steve, Joey, we talked about doing a combined live show together. And the Red Sox are not going to make the playoffs. So that <clears throat> I feel like that ship has sailed. But Kowloon still has that big ass like video board where they do like the drive in movie theater. And I was like, how would you feel if we did uh, like a cross promo podcast evening where we just watched Titanic with our listeners? Wow. If we just had everyone come to the Kowloon and <clears throat> we all it was like a watch party. It was a Titanic watch party. And Andy was like, let's do it. So that bangs. dude. That's mm -hmm. crazy. So instead of like a live podcast, like who fucking cares at this point, we could do. And he was like, it, it might have to be like later in September, like October. I was like, these are baseball fans like we are used to being outside in September and October for the most part. Uh, if it's a little chilly, it's a little chilly. Like it was, it was certainly very chilly on the night that uh, the Titanic sank as well. Like it's, we're not, trust me, no one's sitting here saying it's going to be a little too chilly to watch Titanic outside at Kowloon. So I want to nail down a date. I don't even know that Steve and Joey are going to want to do this because like the Titanic thing is not like, I don't think it's a bit with them, but no, we did they had talk something. about doing a combined podcast or like a combined live show, but whatever. I, I saw a clip on Twitter recently. They had some kind of Titanic bit in their last episode. Oh, I don't no know way. exactly what it was, but <laughs> <laughs> I don't know exactly what it was, but I saw it on Twitter. I know that for sure. Oh. Okay. I didn't see that, but uh, yeah, instead of like a, a live, I mean, we could always do like an hour i was about to and, say yeah because titanic's three hours long like andy was like we have to we have to figure it out because it has to be dark enough to put the movie on the screen but we can't be going until midnight because the, the neighbors will complain do they the bring movies wings to the car huh like the wings will they deliver them to the car what car it's a drive-in isn't it i'm sorry have I you ever been to Kowloon no, before? Have you ever no, I haven't. Been? But I saw a video, and now I actually realize how stupid I sound. It's outdoor, yeah. Just, Jake, cut that out. <laughs> I legit saw a video legit a week ago. I don't know why I was thinking about it that way. I mean, I'm just saying, Jake... Also, don't Jake know how was, we would We did a live show at Kowloon in 2021. Sold out crowd. They had to add extra seating. Sold those out, too. Uh, Jake was there. Uh, where were you, Tyler? At work. Jake, did you have a job at the time? Oh, yeah, I was working. Yeah. And you were there at the show? I made time for it. Yeah. Did you have an awesome time? It was a blast. Yeah. yeah. It was one of the best times you probably ever had. All I'm saying is the nine, nine, at that time, 98.5, the sports of Tyler Milliken was young. He was trying to mm -hmm. really uh, establish himself. They had my hands tied. So now you're established. So now you can take your foot off the gas, is what you're saying? No, 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 no. Oh, I'm not established. Okay. Right. But okay. at that time, I no one knew who Tyler Milliken was. I think if we do the Titanic watch along, that uh, we should have a merch table with limited edition merch. Like there should be bullet merch. Like there should be, uh, what was the other one? Oh, the <laughs> the, the, the bullet tribute show concert T-shirt. I need that one. Uh, people want. I've heard spare me. People are into the spare me T-shirts. I know that's kind of an old one now. I mean the uh, bullet tribute concert poster that Corey did go how and, and oh and like a clark's ketchup t-shirt come on there's so yeah. many fucking opportunities to make merch like we gotta find we just gotta find like a like a printing company that's local and be like all right what do we gotta do
what are we going to do to like make some limited edition merch that we can sell like just at this show? People want it. People need it. We got to give it to them. It would be gone in 10 seconds. Yeah. 10 fucking seconds. Yeah. All the money goes towards the uh, incinerator that Tyler wants to put in his house to kill your pets. <laughs> yeah. We could really get my business off and, uh, yeah. you know, try to do it in a way where there's not a lot of pain. Yeah. Or, you know, if there's pain, there's pain. <laughs> pain optional. <laughs> you could check the box off on your application. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to get planning on that. Um, my calendar's wide open. Steve and Joey, I got to get them there. I mean, see, it's not really a matter of like, oh, are you too busy? It's like, are you, are you on fucking your third vacation of the goddamn year or not for Steve? What are you doing in Miami right now? It's, it's, it's still hot here. Yeah, th- th- that would be my confusion. I try to go down in December or something like or that. Or November, yeah. Like it was 80 degrees out today. I was sweating my balls off. I was up in Pelham, New Hampshire. A nice little barbecue. By the way, I don't know what's going on with the youth of today, but they're like my friend's kids were we were like they were we were we were sitting on the deck and they were down the stairs like in the yard at their own like like kitty table. And <clears throat> one of the kids comes up the deck and we were like, oh, what are you guys doing down there? This girl goes. Oh, we're just summoning the demons. Oh. Oh. We're like, excuse me? They're like, yeah, there's an app. I guess there's like an app that can, uh, like, it's almost like a, like, like, like ghosts can talk to you through the app. Eliminate the child. <laughs> you, you don't have a choice, dude. So I don't know what the, owl. I'm going to find out. I'm going to find out. I'm going to find out what the app is. But the, the children were talking to ghosts through an app. And they were trying to summon uh, demons in broad daylight. It's like, I don't know, 3.30 in the afternoon on a, on a Sunday. And oh. that's, that's what kids do these days, I guess. Well, let's be real here. If you want to summon demons, summon fucking demons. But you're doing it in broad daylight, dude. What, like, yeah. At least know what you're doing. This sounds like amateur hour. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's also a good thing. Back in and our so, day, we used to do the day. Ouija board. So like, that's what I said. I right? was like, where's the Ouija board at? Like Late at night, okay. dude. You're all sitting in your freaking parents' living room, tweaking out, doing whatever in yeah. broad fucking daylight in a yeah. cluck out. Mm-hmm. Be better. Yeah. They were trying to talk to ghosts. Um, and then, <laughs> so Fuck I, uh, there's a new documentary on Netflix. It is following, I forget what it's called, but it's like uh, following around Jake Paul. And I like Logan Paul. I like Jake Paul. I'm not afraid to. I used to think that they were huge douchebags, but like they're they're uh, modern versions of themselves. I like and Jake Paul. I mean, excuse me. Logan Paul is the one that uh, started Prime. And I keep he's every time he comes on WWE, he's holding Prime. Every time he's on a podcast, he's holding Prime. And I was like, all right, I'll try it. So today I got Prime for the first time. It was good. This is not a paid ad. It was good. I had the energy drink and I brought it to this cookout. And um, so they were talking to the ghosts through this app. And when I walked in, I was holding the can of prime. And apparently prime was one of the words that the ghost said through the app. So they probably thought that I was the demon. Yo, these kids are cooking. What the fuck? Right? They're like, oh, my God, Prime. Like, he said Prime and he has Prime. And I was like, wow, I don't know what the fuck's going on here. You let me shit talk them? What? I'm going to fuck me up now. Well, no, I don't think that, that they probably think that I am some sort of like demon representation in, in human form. I buy in. Something's going on. That's weird that you showed up with that. What flavor? Uh, what was it? Blue raspberry or some shit like that? Okay. Not red. I would have think blue or blood or something like death. Blue your blood is blue before oxygen hits it. That's why it turns red is because it becomes oxidized. And what happens to a body when it dies? It turns blue, right? Um, no, no, I thought that was a thing. (laughs) Maybe that's frostbite. I don't know. I don't know. We've gone, we've gone to blue lips. Like, haven't you heard of that blue lips? Like on a dead person. I, I mean, like, I think it's more of like an expression like, Oh, like he, you turn blue or it's like if you can't breathe, your face turns blue. If you die, you turn like fucking 
like greenish brown. <laughs> Is it true you shit yourself when you die? Yeah. That's so fascinating. Your body like releases everything. So you like piss and shit yourself when you die. Such a tough blow. <laughs> yeah, it's a tough <laughs> way to go out. Yeah. It happens to everybody, you know? Tough feature. Yeah. Tough feature. <laughs> I don't know why they made us that way, but they did. You have to take that up with uh, the man upstairs. Like great design flaw, Jesus. <laughs> really? The last my last act on earth is I'm gonna shit in my pants. <laughs> it's just the most humiliating thing that can ever happen yeah. to somebody. It's like yeah, you're gonna no, go out and hate There's your no life. graceful way to do it. There really isn't. I don't like yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. Do you think it happens like even in like an yeah. awful accident? Definitely. Like what if you get turned to ash, you don't just turn you just can't shit yeah, I ass. Guess. Yeah, I don't think Paul Walker shit himself. Is it too soon to say that? <laughs> no. Part of the reason why I burn dogs is for that reason. Uh, <laughs> what? Sorry. Because of Paul Walker? No, I, I don't want uh, any messes after the job's done. Oh, right, 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 right. Yeah. Well, <sighs> on that note. Um, you have any uh any other topics that you want to bring up in this this three hour podcast? Um, actually, I did have a small little uh, oh, prospect okay. update. Yeah, yeah, I know, give us that I, prospect I know, update. If you're people still want it, yep. people are begging for it. You will love I it. I can scroll down and find it. Here we go. Ah, uh, yeah, your Donnie Monegro had his uh, high A debut two nights ago. Now five hits, four or five innings, four hits, zero and runs, eight Ks, one walk. Across 60 and two-thirds innings this year. It's a 193 ERA, 221 FIP, all the way from the FCL this year. So he's climbed multiple levels. Now in a spot where I think he's 29th on Sox Prospects rankings, I expect him to make a pretty solid jump, at least in their next one or their end-of-season rankings. Another name you can actually follow and be excited about in the Red Sox system, that's a pitcher. Hmm. All right, we got to take a break and talk about Zinn Nicotine Pouches. We're always talking about what a team needs to get to number one, but Zinn nicotine pouches are already there. Zinn has helped millions of people achieve lasting chains, earning the title of America's number one nicotine pouch. If you're a smoker or you're a dipper looking to make a change, look no further than Zinn. Zinn is made with six simple ingredients and is available in a wide range of varieties, including spearmint, citrus, and even coffee. And it's available in two strengths so you can control your nicotine satisfaction. Because it's discreet, you can enjoy it anywhere, anytime, so you never have to miss a moment of the game. Plus, every can of Zinn earns you points towards premium items like tailgating gear, top-of-the-line tech, Zinn swag, even gift cards. Find your Zinn at your local convenience store or online at Zinn.com. That's Zinn, Z-Y-N dot com. Warning, this product contains nicotine. Nicotine is an addictive chemical. People like prospect talk, especially now. It's all about the future. It's all about the game and how you play it. Kanye West. No. Um, What's his name? Fucking Napoleon. No. What the fuck is it? Dr. Dre. Lemmy. Lemmy. His name is Lemmy. The lead singer of Motorhead. I don't know what that is. You don't know what Motorhead is? No. And neither does Jake. Oh my god. He's so fucking stupid. Correct, Jake? It's actually. I'm going to play the song and you're both going to know. Yep. You're both going to know. Time to play the game. Boom. Time to play the game! You don't know this song? <laughs> nope. You don't know this song. It sounds like something I do on Guitar Hero. It sounds like what? Like Guitar Hero. It's all about the game! And how you play it? It's all about control! If you can take it! I fucking hate you. Dog, those vocals are fucking garbo. What? <laughs> Dude, what is he? Uh, clear the voice. He needs to do something. A, a cough. What First of all, he's drops? dead. First of all, he's dead. R.I.P. King. You've never heard of Motorhead. No. You've never heard that. They play that at every Bruins game. I'm not it at used to be. Games. It used to be Josh Reddick's walk-up song with okay. the Red Sox. And it has been Triple H's entrance theme since... 
2002. Yeah, uh, I'm looking at it right here. Are they like, uh, who would they tour with? Like Nickelback? What? I, I don't know. I, I, this isn't my style of music. Dude, it's a wrestling entrance theme. I, what does that mean? Did I they nailed it? that, by the way. It came out in April 2002. Right around it, the thong song time. And it, it's still being played today. If you go to a Bruins game, you will hear that song. I'm down on it. I'm down on you. I'm sorry. You're down on Jake then as well. No, Jake knows the song. Jake, you playing that in the fucking car? You bumping that shit? I'm not bumping it now. <laughs> Thank not, you. Yeah, that's not. There's a difference between bumping it and knowing that it's Triple H's. Entrance. You like that song? I'm, I don't listen to Motorhead. I know who they are, obviously, oh, but okay. like I listen to that song because it's Triple H's entrance theme. I, I respect people who are into like heavy metal. It's just not my my forte. I'm about the bars. I can't believe I can't believe that you've never even heard it. It uh, like the the style of music sounds familiar, but no, I, I would never be able to tell you that was Motorhead. Fuck you! <laughs> it's actually insane how stupid you are. Is it? Yeah. If I started naming fucking songs for me, you wouldn't know what they are. Yeah, I know all those songs that you like. I know all the hit songs. I'm not old. <laughs> I'm not I'm old. Or in young. Old I am man. young. I am young. What was your favorite song off of uh, Good I Am? Wow. <laughs> this one. <laughs> this does sound like it would bang. It does. It all about the game. Weighing it at 275 pounds, he is the game. Crazy. Crazy that you don't know that. Crazy. I'm here in the game. I'm thinking of the game, the rapper, the documentary, the red album. That's what I'm thinking. You know what you should be thinking? What? About how you bring shame to this podcast for not knowing that song. More people are going to be talking about, oh, damn, the game. I know what Tyler, good AM, Mac Miller. I don't matter. Motor fucking head, dude. <laughs> motor. <laughs> I'm not sitting here saying that, like, I'm a big Motorhead fan. It's just like, you know. You got to know that song. I'll add it to my playlist. All right, cool. Um, all right. We'll be back on what? Wednesday? Uh, yeah, three game series. All right. Yep. Wednesday's going to be another day where I'm just fucking pissed. <laughs> Angry at the world. <laughs> We're yeah, going to have Wednesday, fun. Wednesday. All right. Just in advance, everyone. Wednesday, I have to do baseball is dead. I'm going on foul territory. Then I got to drive to do Maz, watch the game, and then do name redacted. So I'm going to be fucking pissed after that sweep that the Red Sox have to endure. Hey. Look at me. Off day on Thursday. Not for me. Thursday, uh, baseball is dead. Then I'm going to Kirk. And then I'm getting tattooed after that. So I'm going to be pissed. I'm going to be in pain. I'm going to be pissed. That's how I'm spending my off day. Just miserable, you're have tired, fun, pissed. And you're going to like it. Yeah, I'm going to get I'm getting a, I'm getting all this in here on Thursday. Woo! Yeah. Which is Tat also reveal. happens to be the worst most painful place to get tattooed the inside of the bicep what are you flexing right now yeah that's what you why do. dude that's what it was what guys do that's what the boys do. that's what flex. the boys do they flex that's what we do that's what they do boys flex yeah yeah dude do we want we want to do a flexing picture here no garrett will post it on uh on uh x he's great He's the he's, man. Yeah, he's got a database of great reaction uh, clips from the show. All the highlights. He pops on uh, Twitter every time. I always yeah. retweet him. Yeah, he's great. Shout out to Garrett. Um, Jake's takes? I uh, just can't wait to get together with the boys this weekend and do some flexing. <laughs> <laughs> 
That's just what the boys do. So, all right. Uh, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Um, hope this was a little bit more positive for you this time around so you don't have to fucking complain about the show for 38 consecutive threads saying the same goddamn thing over and over again. What is that, a 99 gift card? Hit me up, 99. There's people. They're talking. Yeah, this sponsor Tyler got. Milliken. If you're the 99, have Tyler Milliken be in your commercials. It's a great I, way to drive business away. I know what's good at the 99. Everything's good, but I know the best stuff. If you want an expert, hit me up and I'll keep tweeting at them. I want to see the pictures of the mozzarella moons and the buffalo tenders. All right. At the end of the season, I'm going to take you guys to the 99. You mean that? Yeah. It's the nicest thing you ever said to me. Yeah. I mean, there's a 99 right down the street from my house. So, like, uh, we can we can hang out here, have a little... Uh, I was going to say a pizza party, but that would defeat the purpose if we're going to 99. We can do both. We can... Why not? Yeah, a little I know you pizza want after. We, but yeah, just... You got to pick one. <laughs> End the podcast. <laughs> Suck on Fuck it. you. Okay, bye. Buenas noches, amigos.